So um, thank you all for being here today. I'm really happy to welcome you to Nottingham Contemporary if this is the first time you've been here, although I see many familiar faces also in the audience, so welcome back and we're really happy that you're able to join us for the second October Dialogues here at Nottingham Contemporary. Um, as you probably know, October Dialogues is developed um, by our partners at the Centre for uh, Research in Race and Rights at the University of Nottingham. Um, and this is our second uh, October Dialogues. Last year we met around current thinking within the Black Lives Matter movement and brought together activists, organizers, early and later career researchers to plot the possibilities for new forms of allyship, solidarity, and action against racism on a national, on a local, and an international scale. Since that time, Nottingham has reclaimed its past as a hotbed of activity against racism in all aspects of society with regular meetings, events, actions, and community celebrations. Um, but at the same time, we've been seeing and hearing higher levels of racism, homophobia, the number of hate crimes in the city, and others, um, uh, presence of right-wing racializations in terms of the issues that we're dealing with, with the kind of ongoing empire today. Back, but I think um, it's um, and going to be happening over the next um, uh, let any kind of know how to handle that. So um, I wanted to also say that we are filming and live streaming this today. So if there's anything that you want to say that's of a sensitive nature, um, and that you don't want broadcast, then please let us know. We can turn off those kind of cameras at any moment and you just have to kind of let us know and we'll do that. Um, also, I just wanted to say a big thank you to the often kind of um, hidden and invisible labor of things like these kinds of events. Um, and so I wanted to thank um, everybody at the Center for Research and Race and Rights and Katie in particular for an incredible organizational feat. Um, but also the team here at Nottingham Contemporary, including Merce, Alba, Paul, Craig, and Chloe. So um, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the next two days and I'm looking forward to kind of getting into the discussions. Okay, good morning. Um, it's a huge pleasure to be able to welcome you all here today to the people that uh, I already know, that I work with, um, that have come from all over the country. Thank you so much for participating. Um, and to the people I've yet to meet, I'm so excited to have this opportunity uh, to find out more about what's going on uh, uh, in terms of the public co-direct a number of and the commitment that one who are our partners uh, event uh, dub poet um, for as well so before uh, I go on uh, to explain a little bit more about the event, I also just wanted to say a huge thank you to the British Academy who uh, have funded this uh, event. Uh, and this is the first in a series of events that are going to be taking place uh, over the course of the next year, uh, looking at the ways in which uh, slavery has been represented uh, through arts, through education and through public history. And those events will be taking place in London, Liverpool and Hull. So hopefully uh, some of you will be able to uh, make it to some of those as well. So it's my passionate belief that history matters fundamentally to our understanding of ourselves, our society and the wider world. I think the stories that we tell about the past are bound up in a sense of individual, community, local and national identity. The history of transatlantic slavery does not sit well with Britain's idea of itself as a freedom loving, liberal, and democratic nation. I think this came, comes out very, very clearly when you look at the ways in which uh, the subject of history has been framed in public discourse. Um, I was particularly interested when I was reading, not that I would particularly recommend reading it, but I did read it, the UKIP manifesto of 2010, which was entitled Restoring Britishness. Uh, and it actually highlighted transatlantic slavery as an issue which, quote, had been deliberately used to undermine Britishness. Instead, it argued that we should focus on celebrating Britain as, quote, freedoms and trade. Memory, I think, 
comfortable and com abolition identity. Uh, uh, who's coming on later today in 2000? I think it did for the had to learn seven. Has also from Lisa Palmer. From um, yeah. So they both work. Uh, yes. Uh, Is there a way to just kind of hold it on, as the main screen? So it look like I think there's a way to pause it. To pause it, yeah, exactly. That would be the best thing to do. Sure. Yeah. Um, pause. Do that okay. okay, and so when she starts talking, we get a thing and it's on rotation. If for some reason the yeah. moving itself doesn't work, the loop, continuous loop, I can. I just do it. I can get yeah. it. Oh, there is. Yeah. There is somebody. Yeah. I don't know. There's somebody. Oh, uh, we were just talking about how, um, yeah, just which kind of universities are here or not oh, yeah. here, and like, is there anyone from like Liverpool or Bristol? Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. 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 Hello everyone, um, I hope you were able to kind of introduce yourselves to one another and um, of course the conversations will unfold throughout the day. But we're going to begin the first panel um, and this panel will situate questions around the ongoing legacy of the transatlantic slavery within the visual culture of British Empire. And I'm joined by two prominent artists who have challenged this legacy in a number of ways about the various lives, spectrums, and kind of infusing the li living legacies of past and present activity and of creativity of um, of schools and, and, and the one blacks head quite so it's both a document looking at those there's also a look at the Moorish figure this is of black people and uh, contemporary ideas of black people there's ones that look like a bit like Michael Jackson but then they're steel pan players all those all the stereotypes that you can think of as black people I've so also noticed recently they're starting to represent real people that you you know, someone you can actually name, you can go to their grave site or something like that. So there's a kind of incredible mishmash. So at the moment it's, um, it's an archival project, particularly a documentary, but it's hoping, working towards it being an art project. So it's engaging with those ideas and mediating between the signs and the audience so that it isn't just, bam, these signs knock you in the head. Um, and also a lot, a lot of my practice is to do with being, I do a lot of residencies within the UK, so it's immersing myself in rural areas, which is kind of echoing some of this, but it's also, you know, headbutting with, you know, landowners who own vast amounts, as well as the small 
working class rural communities that are working in farms who are scrabbling around in the mud like a lot of a lot of us really struggling to you know have a voice within their local community so it's quite important to actually be totally immersed in you know village life go to the Cayleys and the choir and that sort of thing so that oh, those that idea it's um, just kind of knocking some of the ideas that it's a recent thing the 1950s and so if I'm there in front of their face, they can't actually say there's no black people here. You know, you can just slip in underneath. Uh, less confrontational, but more sitting in their houses, drinking their tea, having a conversation about tea and sugar and wheat. And what, where does that come from exactly? It's sugar, you know. So that's kind of an important idea. And also, um, Jan was mentioning about, about biography, using the archive for my personal biography, um, there's some work uh, looking at um, archives from. Could we get the lights down a little bit, Paul? Using personal biographies from, say, the 1950s, I've been looking at a, a family album from a migrant who came from the Caribbean and the letters he wrote back. To so it's looking at his postcard voice, so that it's it's another voice of empire. It's usually it's more hidden than concealed. It's because it's in people's homes, and that kind of particular experience of being in England uh, is, is raising those up, so they become part of the foreground, become that voice of empire. So it's looking at um, family albums, that, particularly the letters, but they're, because they're 60 years old now, the ephemera of those blue AML letters, are people familiar with those? That are flowing across the Atlantic, they've become almost sculptural because the ink has gone straight through that very flimsy paper, so sometimes you read what's there, the kind of evidence, I mean you could, so it's just, that's the, a lot of stories of a lot of people here in particular. So yeah, this ghosting this black boy recall. People have no idea about who this black boy was. I was kind of shocked. You know, nobody his frock coat, his white wig, and it's like, right. You, you, they're really invested in their pu local pubs, including the pub sign, which you never get to think of. But there's also people who will deny there's anything to do with black people, even though, hey, in that sign, <laughs> there is a black person, and in the other sign, and because a number of the pubs keep their signs, until they have five signs, they don't paint over them, they're there in the pub, you know, the idea of the runaway slave, and that one is based on the dramas that were in particular army regiments that have been going back since the 1800s, and they've still got drummers in there, so within that pub sign, which is in Warwickshire, they kind of celebrated that particular uh, contribution that black people have made to that particular army regiment. So it's that balance between a real story and a made-up story. Um, is that enough? Um, yeah. Really it's great. Yeah, you've done five minutes. That's fantastic. fantastic. Thank you so much, Ingrid. And I, I think we'll pick up some of those um, themes in the conversation. So I'm going to move over to Evan um, to yeah. Yeah. What's going on. Yeah. Um, so hi everyone. Um, and yeah, as Jan as Jana mentioned, uh, my practice does encompass uh, many forms, including moving image, performance, sound, and writing. But today I'm going to focus on um, or start by kind of drawing on to educational resources I actually developed whilst working with uh, Tate's Schools and Teachers program. And then hopefully later um, during the conversation I can elaborate on my practice with um, collective creativity, which is also very yeah, important to the work I do. But firstly, I just want to share um, an anecdote which has really kind of um, inspired my kind of educational creative practice. Um, so, so kind of around 2012, 2013, when I was doing one of these kind of artist-led workshop sessions, um, a young student, so I was working with a group of young students, probably around six or seven. Um, it was a group of students from the local borough of Southwark, so a very diverse group of students. And, and one of the young students, um, you know, white male, um, asked me to pass um, him a colouring pencil. And I said, what colour do you need? And he said, oh, I can't say. 
I said, oh, okay. Um, and then I just kind of grabbed the pencils and just said, okay, do you want to point out to me which pencil you need? And then he pointed that one over there and he pointed to the black pencil. So, so I was quite surprised, I was quite perplexed. I kind of thought, oh, okay, so, so I don't know if it's, if it's his parents or if it's the teachers that you know, have somehow kind of told him that he's not allowed to say the word black. I kind of thought, wow, is this, is this where we are? But <laughs> we can't even say the word. It's like, how do we even engage with you know, the legacy of slavery and empire if we can't even kind of say the word black? Um, so, so, so that moment has been really kind of pivotal in creative work institutions, and I kind of refer to them as the, the black pencil moment. Um, you know, the kind of the, the moment of kind of needing to say something that for some reason you feel because of some kind of, you know, how my art gives space to those difficult conversations. And if at the end of uh, the year of working on that program, oh, you know, I forgot to say, so the images that, uh, that will be kind of moving around the back will be a kind of combination of images from, you know, work that uh, the collective and I have been doing, but then also kind of images that draw on uh, my kind of educational creative practice as well. Um, and, yeah, so kind of at the end of that year working with the school's program, uh, you know, I was invited to produce a poster, um, and I actually decided to... Um, base my work on. So it's partly based on that painting, which is called um, Punch and May Day, um, and then also by uh, another painting, which actually in the Tate Britain sits next to it, uh, front representation. Because um, I was quite, uh, you know, the kind of the level of education, I read it. One of those issues, Artists and Empire exhibition, which was staged at uh, Tate Britain. Um, and with that work, I again drew on my interest in kind of archives, mapping and collage to produce um, a series of three videos. And actually, rather conveniently, it is <laughs> that image right now. Um, yeah, so the three, the three videos that I made were called um, Map Making as Colonial Project. Um, the second one was called Negotiating the Poorest Boundaries of Cultural Influence. And then the third, um, What to Do with the Past. Um, and, and, and those works kind of intentionally, you know, kind of use your yeah, kind of collage and layering and um, kind of layer together kind of different images and texts and questions. Um, and actually part of that research as well kind of led me to um, discovering that uh, the Black Audio Film Collective work Signs of Empire was actually kind of held within the Tate collection. So, um, so, so these videos are available to kind of watch via Tate's website. Um, kind of connected to the exhibition and, and you're also able to, to watch the Black Audio Film Collective work as well online. Um, so, you know, these resources are kind of continue to be available um, to, yeah, to kind of use within classrooms or, you know, home context as well. Um, and the three videos that I produced kind of drew, drew on um, the Black Audio for their work, Empire is Over to die drawing on that and so with the the three works so the first work map making is colonial project um, so, so mapping and map making is something that's really quite integral to some of the work I'm making at the moment really thinking about the, the second yeah, issues of you know, some work by Colonel um and explore uh, and also think of the present moment so it looks at kind of the you know the Colston statue in Bristol and, and kind of explore some of the um, I guess some of the protests that had been kind of happening around that with, uh, you know, bands like kind of Massive Attack refusing to play at Colston Hall and, and whether these kind of signs or symbols should be removed or whether they should continue to exist in the present. So it kind of draws on that as well. Um, and I'm aware that time is really pressing on. So I'm just going to kind of um, just close by saying, yeah, I hope that there'll be time as well to kind of draw on some of the work of collective creativity and some of our own work around kind of archives and, yeah, the kind of the, um, the practices of um, black artists in Britain. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you to you both. Right. So um, we're going we're gonna to chat for a few really conscious people based on what we've heard so far. But this is to do with, um, I suppose, terminology. Um, and one of the, the things that we talked about in forming this panel was um, what the terms we wanted to use to describe these kind of practices. And so both of you were very interested in widening, widening the perspective beyond the kind of conversation around transatlantic slavery towards um, the British Empire and, and, and questions of imperialism. And I wondered if you wanted to talk a bit about that politically, but also from the perspective of being people who make visual culture and, and where that, you know, how that happens for you. Um, I mean, I, I think for me, the reason was, um, I think that it's quite 
easy or something I've kind of noticed um, is that it can be quite easy to kind of say okay slavery or you know the transatlantic slave trade was this thing that kind of happened in a moment in time um, mm -hmm. and that it's kind of passed mm -hmm. and so it kind of is only looked at as a historical moment whereas I think if we're looking at kind of it in relation to kind of empire and imperialism for me it becomes more about thinking okay so how do these things kind of persist in the present mm -hmm. and, 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 and and yeah I mean of course actually we're still dealing with the legacy of slavery but I think just for me kind of the, the reframing it or kind of dealing with it in terms of those words for me seems to allow for a wider conversation or the, just that's what I've kind of experienced mm. um, when trying to engage with people about it. Mm. So that was, yeah. Ingrid, did you have a uh, response to that? I mean, yes, just the idea that language is very important yeah. even though people maybe have trouble asking for the black pencil or saying mm. enslaved or enslaved or liberated Africans or mm. all the different terms. Every time you someone stumbles over them, it's an opportunity to talk about it and, mm. and make it feel almost, uh, it's okay to just talk about it, mm. I think, so, mm. yeah, so the terminology, I mean, it changes the situation I'm in and who I'm talking to and how we're talking about it, mm. so, yeah. Great, um, and I think, I mean, something that obviously came up in both of your um, presentations um, is to do with how we engage with archives. So both archives as in materials or albums you were referring to, letters, um, but also the kind of grand archive, um, the, the sort of memory, you know, I'm thinking, Ingrid, of your work, um, pastoral interlude of images in the countryside um, and, and just how, what the countryside and the, the kind of picture of the English countryside evokes in terms of narrative. So that is also a kind of grand archive um, of, of a living archive. Um, so I'm wondering, and, and Evan, you've used the term querying to describe different kinds of engagement that you've had with the archive. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about that, but also the relationship between um, kind of putting yourselves in the archive and in relation to the archive, so the juxtaposition of, um, of autobiographical text, but also um, performance, images of yourself, in your case, Evan, um, in relation. How does that strategy? And I know, it's very big response to me this is about yeah like I'm really invested in mm -hmm. exploring histories looking into histories but I don't want to take what I'm presented with at false value because I know that ultimately again you know what we're seeing is is one side of the story you know from from either angle and that ultimately there's always going to be a multitude of other perspectives and I'm I'm kind of interested in in the gaps in in the things that we don't see or or what might be um, kind of underneath the story that we've been presented with. So, so, so quite often in the work that I do, in revisiting these these um, histories, I'm also trying to retell or rework or slightly change the story. Um, so that's, I guess, where this idea of the appropriation comes in, where I might work with historical material, but I might fictionalise it. I might slightly shift or rework. And it's not about. So for me, it's not about presenting a new truth. It's about also. It's just about kind of. Um, presenting kind of other angles or approaches to the story or the narrative, mm -hmm. because ultimately there is always other perspectives, mm -hmm. there's always other ways of telling it. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I guess I'm interested in the, the kind of gaps where you're never ever going to find, the, there is no documentation, there's it might be just a snippet, you just have their names in a document, it's mm -hmm. about the minutiae of being in those archives. I mean, a lot of it's online now, but just looking looking and finding some tiny details. I've been looking for this black servant, John Morocco, for like about 20 years, but <laughs> in that I've found the other kind of black people that are also working in the grand house he was in, that, hey, no one's accounted for these people, mm -hmm. but, and they're, they're, yeah, mm -hmm. they look for the grand name, but it's in a house that's connected to the colonies in, uh, north, in, in, in the west coast of, east coast of America in the, you know, in the 1700s when they were first exploring and claiming that land. Mm -hmm. So there will be, you know, their relationship to black people and Native Americans is very particular, but it's just finding things you never know. And also, mm -hmm. when there's that gap, you'll never fit in. It's just filling it in with something becomes part of the praxis that you, mm -hmm. based on a lot of knowledges, ideas, imaginations, ghostings, you put something in there in that space that bounces off onto other questions. So it's just filling in those gaps that you'll never have the information for. What do you actually do with that gap? Then it's just a, 
Great. And um, maybe we can come back also because I know there's a lot of people in the room who also actively engage with archives, either, either as researchers or people who make archives. So I think maybe at the table conversation, those kinds of strategies of dealing with archives, um, their truths or not truths, what's present and absent, could be a, a really great topic. Um, we're, we just have one more thing that we're going to talk about really briefly, and that's um, to do with institutions, and, um, and that it's, it's very related to the question of archives, but um, uh, I'm just quite interested in the fact that um, both of you have used the spaces and institutions of contemporary art to intervene into kind of living legacies of empire, imperialism, and slavery. And um, often the contemporary is seen as a space in which um, we kind of invent or produce something new or, you know, produce new narratives, new directions. But I'm wondering about the tension between that conversation and the actual um, uh, ways in which such cultural institutions as this one and others are, are still immersed in a legacy of British imperialism and, and empire. And so I know we can't uh, solve that problem or get into it, and we'll have a lot of events this year maybe probing it, but I wonder just to kick off a conversation, which I'm sure we'll come back to throughout the day, about institutions um, and, and what their role is in the current kind of conversation and problematic. Yeah, I mean, that's a... Uh that's a <laughs> again. It's another big question because even um, you know, even kind of uh, you know, recently with the with the artists of empire exhibition that was you know kind of staged at Tate. Like it, like I said, it was a very contentious mm -hmm. exhibition um, that uh, you know really was quite flawed in in many ways. I think sure. and and actually. Um, you know, I kind of, I did feel like, you know, kind of being brought in um, as an artist to kind of intervene within learning was an attempt to kind of, yeah, redress some stuff. But then also, it's like ultimately, you know, this is this is content that exists on the website. It's not there in the space. So mm -hmm. even though it's providing a, you know, a different. Um, or more kind of complex conversation. It doesn't exist for the you know the everyday um, visitor to the to the gallery to the exhibition. So I'm aware that you know it's still kind of positioned in a particular way, you know. And 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 so I do kind of yeah I'm aware of what my position is in that. And and I did you know I was kind of yeah I did um and uh you know for quite a long time about whether to even participate. But then I realised that for me it's you know it's still important that that the information is there, you know, e even though it's not as perhaps visible and immediate as the exhibition itself, like it's still important to engage with the themes in, in some way rather than no way, mm -hmm. you know, because it, this is something that I, I think about as well is like whether to even, you know, work with these kinds of major institutions, whether it's even, you know, whether to completely just um, to disengage, but ultimately, you know, I feel like it, if, if, if I'm not somehow contributing to the conversation, will it be happening yeah. at this kind of level? So. Um, yeah, so there's always some kind of compromise. And yeah, also unfortunately. Also the bigger there institution is. in terms of yeah. education. That yeah. That's, that's nationwide and how we intervene as practitioners, educators mm. into those. And also I was just thinking about uh, the national collections that do have the work of a range of different um, cultures with already within their collection, but then they don't, that, that stays in the basement the whole time. Mm. So it's just, digging those out and what are those forgotten artists that are already in the collection. It's the same within education, that the mm. minutiae of the tiny amount of professors and even within education. So that the young people that are maybe coming into education, the dialogue they can have about their work with particular themes, mm -hmm. they continue to have a struggle with that. Mm. You know, to find people that are like, engaged. There's a lot of incredible educators already out there, but sometimes that that there's a different dialogue that has to be Mm. So I'm interested in stuff that's already within those institutions, but you know, well hidden in the basement, mm -hmm. you know, the psychological basement. Yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's not talk Sometimes about that. Sometimes the actual yeah. basement. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, so I think you, you guys have put quite a bit on the table for us to think about. Um, I want to open up right now to the audience to see if there's any questions um, that you want to ask the panelists right now before we move on to discussions at the tables. Sorry, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's there are microphones that are coming around, so if you just wait, and maybe if you feel comfortable with it, saying sort of your name and uh, you know where you, what, or if you work with an organization or what city you're from or something like that would be great. Well, I'm
Somewhere along the line, Oliana decided not to engage with the sign writers and taking them as of where, where I meet the signs in a particular landscape. But I haven't been able to avoid coming across sign writers and their expression of what they want to do and how they want to work. So I've made a decision not to engage with the sign writer because it, it makes it too, too complicated for me looking at you know, ethnographically and how that sign sits in the wider UK. So some of them, yes, have painted real people. Some of them are really engaged in what they're doing. But I was trying to stay stayed away from actually meeting them. From the signs, I'm not sure. I haven't met any because I've chosen not to meet them. But I do have. I do come. There's a pub sign society and I have kind of conversations with them and collect the magazines so sometimes they talk about the sign writers but they don't see that black boy sign it's any different from the queen's head or the, the white horse or anything they don't they so don't they're not between sign writers I have come yeah. across through literature one or two that are representing real black people historical that you can find them so I don't know if they're thinking this is a bit of positive discrimination. That I'm there I'm painting a story as I've heard it. Mm. But the way they choose it wouldn't be the there's a range of illustrative s styles you can incorporate so that becomes problematic. They might have a good heart but then they choose mm. to represent it in a way that I think is really horrible. <laughs> horrible. Yeah, yeah, horrible. Yeah. So it's it's problematic, which is which is good. Could I ask Evan a question? Um, when you were talking about mapping, um, yeah. I, it's really interesting sort of thinking about, because I work in marketing and I think about m segmentation of different um, areas in Nottingham, for example. And Nottingham is the heart of Experian, which developed a sort of mosaic pattern of segmentation in, right. in Nottingham. And they have almost like a social apartheid that really does reinforce all the stereotypes. And only, you know, certain categories have all the positive attributes all the way through their lifetime, whereas other people, other groups, will have negative attributes all the way through their lifetimes. And, you know, how do you overcome that? It, it's interesting thinking about marketing as a sort of, in a much more productive way, thinking about it as, you know, more challenging. How can you challenge mapping? Because I remember when you were talking about mapping, you were saying something about, um, you know, it, it's really interesting. I thought straight away about the woman who walked the streets of London and created the A to Z, because mm. she felt there was something needed to be mm. done. And isn't that how things happen? And I'm just wondering what you think about that. About that particular... About, about, about mapping and about how we can change things through mapping differently. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you, know, I, you know, something that I've always encouraged is, is um, you know, when working with people is, is for us to kind of create our own maps of our kind of local environments and and think but not not just on a local but also kind of on a global scale because you know quite often we're kind of you know connected to other countries here there or everywhere as well so thinking about um because because also when you know something i'm quite interested in is when you're looking at maps is is scale and how actually you know certain countries are a lot smaller than they actually are so also thinking about the images that we have in our head of where certain countries are and how big they are and thinking about that as well like what ideas or of places do we already have do we already bring with us and actually how put, putting that out there and plotting that how that can then kind of lead to a you know quite an interesting dialogue quite a long time i'm not sure how that connects for marketing i, I though. have one idea and then, okay, I'll, then i'll get yeah. the next question yeah. but i just um, yeah. i think the question is also really yeah. related to institutions and what you were right. saying about what's upstairs what's downstairs right. so the you know the exhibition might be very radical or the yeah. education department program might be radical but the marketing department's relying on very racist and state kind of categories and i think these kinds of questions are really important like how do we map the different 
practices on to different departments within institutions. And, um, and I can say, just as a small plug, the Center for Research in Race and Rights is about to start a two-year study with New Art Exchange and ourselves and uh, galleries of justice on this very question about how do institutions sort of come up with other ways of thinking about their relationships with communities versus these Experian kind of categories that are also reflected sometimes in the Arts Council uh, um, uh, requirements of evaluation oh, yeah. as well. So, you know, it's it's not just market researchers or marketers that use those kinds of um, terminologies and categorizations. So, but anyway, uh, yes, sorry, chair shouldn't speak. Um, can I get? Yeah, do you, we just need a mic right here in the middle? Great, thanks. Hello, um, I'm Miranda Kaufman. Um, I'm writing a book about Africans in Tudor England. Um, I uh, thank you so much. It's all really thought-provoking. Um, Evan, I was wondering about um, the black boy pub signs. Um, I, I was wondering um, how, how, like, whether do you know how early that the pub started being called that, and if you actually had found any examples where you were able to trace, um, you know, exactly what, you know, who, why it was named that. Well, that's. That's the question, isn't it? That's what everybody <laughs> asks. I mean, the pub signs, I think they were, they're, they're always linked to priories or landowners originally when people were m more illiterate than they. So, you know, the grapes would be a sign that the wine's in or the hops, you know, that that brewery, that sets in. So, you know, it would be then be called the Duke of Northumberland because that's on his land or mm. the five stars because it's a Jewish church. So, I mean, so I think it's the, like, 16 something when this pub started to be named originally they would be named by the pub owner rather than the pub itself so the line gets passed down that way and i think it's I think it's about 200 years after it starts to be the pub name that's the important thing mm -hmm. so but you can also think the connection t between coffee houses they're also you know places of descent but then they, they will be where the merchants were that's the area of political discussion and it's also they have rum and sugar there. All those things were a melting point in the in the coffee houses and the inns, taverns. There's a difference between pub houses, public houses. They all have different categories. If you can feed people, stay there. So uh, the earliest ones I've got are like um, 17th century. Mm -hmm. Before that, there weren't there weren't names to look for. Mm -hmm. But the uh, because the sign. I might have a 16th century example for you. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you about that later. Um, sorry, I had a, another broader question for both of you, which is, uh, I don't know, when I've been sort of thinking about the, you know, the Roads Must Fall campaign, um, what I kind of like, the sol imagined solution I quite fancied was to have an artistic intervention into those statues, and it's obviously not just him. Uh, and I was just wondering, you know, if Oriel College called you up and said, could you come <laughs> round and, you know, do an artistic intervention with the statue? We want to keep it on the wall, but what can you do to it to kind of raise a visual question mark over this guy's head? You know, what, what would you do? So can I come in there? Yeah, you know, go for it. When the yeah. Museum of London Docklands had their opening of their Sugar and Slavery exhibition, they had a statue of a, you know, a major slave-owning... Uh, sugar merchants, but they just kind of draped him, and they also redid the the Thames around it just by making the Thames, you know, the red, the, the colour of blood. So there was a simple intervention just by covering him up. He's not there, and I think I'm not sure he's still. He's well, they put like a big black cloth over yeah, him. Yeah, over him. Yeah. You draw attention to him, but then it's, you know, it's also veiled. He's hidden. He's not mm. important. So that was a simple, yeah. simple intervention. But yeah, I. I mean, I quite like the idea of that because I, I, you know, I'm kind of hesitant to kind of spend too much energy focusing on the statue, you know what I mean? I mm. think it's quite easy to kind of focus on the objects rather than actually what's the impact, mm. you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm more interested in, in that. So I, I think, yeah, fine, put a, put a cover yeah, over his head. So, so they're so so still there. Like, I'm not for things disappearing or becoming yeah. invisibilized, but I'm definitely not about focusing on the objects. You know, um, so so for me, that's that's not that yeah. exciting. Like, I'd much rather be having conversations with people and actually making work that that kind of starts a dialogue um, with so people on so the ground. Many yeah. Just around yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Really and I should, what's the impact, you know, of mm. of of that legacy and in the present? The pub signs. A lot of people just want to get rid of the black boy sign because they are you know, vaguely insulting, but then that's also not a solution. Yeah. You just deny yeah. that. 
the, you know, the, how many images of black people just around for hundreds and hundreds of years, mm -hmm. you know, the amount of pubs there are. So I would say not to get rid of them, but just to act, use it as a prompt for the discussion. And exactly. So maybe we can take one more question and then go to the table discussion. Skinder at the back. The question is around curatorial bias and um, the experience of the artists in particular um, around this. And before you, what, what I'm sort of getting to is that when curators design space and work with artists, they have a particular, you know, personal connection, subjective kind of um, relationship with art and knowledge. And, you know, over the years, over the last 20, 30 years, when, say, for example, the Black Art Group formed to where we are today, um, what sort of, um, sort of uh, cultural biases are you experiencing with institutions, and have you seen any shifts? Um, so that, that, that's a question just to park for a minute. Just on the pub sign, it's quite interesting, because we've just uh, done a project in the Black Country to design some new pub signs uh, with pub landlords from the Asian community, in particular the Punjabi community. And it's been an interesting process in terms of what's been created. And the, again, it comes to curatorial bias and intent um, about what is designed and what's presented and why it sits there. So in our case, the intent of the sign is to present a positive story and a representation of courage, bravery, um, and overcoming you know, uh, racism. And so the, the signs are designed in such a way um, again, you know, with a curatorial and creative team that has an intent to redress the imbalance of, you know, visual imagery, um, we've been able to create this uh, project and it's had an amazing response from the audiences, the case, and I urge you, um, I think you'll enjoy it, I'm happy to take you there. Um, but coming back to the question, um, which is about curatorial bias, how is that shifting and, and are you experiencing that a lot more in 21st century Britain? I don't, not quite sure. Curatorial bias. What does that mean? What, what do you mean by that, Skinder? Well, when people are commissioned or when a space or institution um, is looking to present a program, how do they engage the artists? Um, do, are you finding that you know, your work is more um, relevant in, in this, this age, are you getting more opportunities as artists to reflect your, um, your voice, your ideas, um, and is, is, is what, has, what has been the shift then? You know? right, to uh, like a kind of increasing interest in, in you know, black artist practice, but I think something I'm glad to see is it's less centered around the fact that the artists are black and more around what, what's contained within the practices. Um, but then at the same time, there are the kind of the historical kind of exhibitions as well, which do kind of look, but I would say in terms of kind of contemporary work or kind of work that people are making now, it's definitely, they're not being framed as black art exhibitions, are they, <laughs> you know? Or, or, yeah, but I mean, yes, with the historical no. ones, yeah, yeah, but not so much with the contemporary ones. Um, I mean, that's something I've kind of noticed um, and definitely seem to find myself more part of. But then actually, I guess, you know, not, n not necessarily from, from a creator's position, but definitely with Network 11, I um, mean, the other um, collective I work with, which is a kind of network of black artists, we, you know, something we've talked about when kind of thinking about exhibition making is that you know, even though we have come together as a group of black artists, we're not in, we're interested in figuring out what is it that actually brings our practices together. Um, you know, and, and you know, something we've realised is that you know we're kind of really invested in, in liveness, in performativity, in sound, and actually, what is it about that? You know, and that it, what is it about the mediums, about the practices around? Um, you know, yeah, what is it from from thinking about it from that position, and actually, what kind of discourse might come as a result of that? So I think I think in that sense, you know, even for us as artists, we're very much thinking curatorially in that sense about how we want our work to be framed. And I think that's because we have the the benefit of of hindsight of being able to look kind of at you know the kind of the artists and the practices and the discourses that came before us, and thinking actually is that how we want to be positioned. 
Um, yeah, so I would say that to kind of West African or South, South African artists. I'm not. Thank you so much. Um, so I think uh, also those two positions might be really interesting to take to our table discussions. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to all of you. Now, um, we were meant to kind of give you questions. There's a few questions we oh, yeah. posed for our own panel with, that we'd love for you to discuss uh, at your leisure um, or at your choice. So one was related to the question of terminology. Do we talk about um, the histories that we're describing in terms of transatlantic slavery within the broader question of empire? What does it mean to do that? The second one about how do we politicize, work with archives in such a way that they actually change things in the present? Um, and the third about institutions and um, are, you know, to what extent are they useful to work with and, and how do we kind of start to formulate change within um, different institutions of practice. So, all right, I will hand over to you and then um, we're going to join you at some of the tables and then we'll come and report back at the end. Thanks. Thank all you right. so much to Evan and Ingrid though. That was really you, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, we have to go. Oh, okay. Are you gonna go in? They get table. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The cutest people. Yeah. Cool. Oh. Okay. Did it up? Yeah. Yes, I'm it right now, so. September launched a, a map designed by David Ajay. Um, and, a, and brilliant. A winch. Let me, um, as a curator of the Sankofa project, um, this is a project in partnership with Brist, Bristol Museums, and it looks to support black community groups and individuals in looking after and developing their own personal collections. The project is funded by Esme Fairben Foundation, and Mitty has a combined honours in history and psychology and a master's in transatlantic history, both from the University of Liverpool. Um, she has gone on uh, to lead the education team at the International Slavery Museum, you must visit, a project officer at the Museum of Liverpool before going on to a current role. Um, her particular interests include exploring the legacies of transatlantic slavery, increasing engagement with museums, for black, Asian, minority ethnic communities and increasing the accessibility um, of the collections through digitization. Emma Winch, on my near left here, um, is the learning manager for Hackney Museum, a small community history museum uh, with an international reputation for its pioneering community engagement program. And in 2007, she was part of the team that worked with the Hackney's uh, communities to create Abolition 07 an exhibition to commemorate the bicentenary of the abolition of slavery and to explore the impact of enslavement on the local community. And since 2007, the museum has continued to work in partnership with local people, um, heritage organizations, universities, to develop learning resources and museum sessions for primary and secondary school children about enslavement, resistance, abolition, and the legacies of slave ownership in Hackney. And in 2014, she was part of the management team that opened the Black Cultural Archives in, Brist in Brixton, which is the UK's first black heritage center um, and is based in London, where she oversaw the learning and exhibition program and co-curated the first two exhibitions, Reimagine Black Women in Britain and Staying Power. Emma organizes the annual UK-wide um, Anti-University Now Festival and sits on the Education Committee for the Migration Museum and also works as a freelance heritage consultant advising organizations on community engagement, writing online and printed learning resources and mentoring early career museum professionals. So to my left I have two very learned uh, colleagues, 
Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to have a conversation um, and we're going to be looking at the two areas, i.e. the institution and what happens inside. Um, and um, then we'll open up Q&A to you guys. And then I think you guys are going to do some work and put up yachts. We'll get to that in just a minute. So without further ado, I think it'd be nice to get <coughs> the specialists speaking now about the subject matter. I thought it might be nice to open the, the, the conversation, Emma and Mitya, about um, the role the museum, the institution plays, because there's a lot being discussed in the last session about the role of the institution. And you're both from large institutions and very small institutions. So the, I suppose the, the question is, um, what, 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 is, what is your experience of running these two um, different institutions, and what is the purpose of the museum? Oh, I'm from the, from the big organisation, so National <laughs> Museums Liverpool. Um, and because we're fu publicly funded, I don't know if this mic's on. It's on. It is. Okay. <laughs> um, because we're publicly funded, I do feel that there's a big responsibility um, to improve access and for it to be to be a public space. I feel that responsibility, particularly with um, the Sankofa project. Um, it's externally funded, but supporting community groups and creating better relationships with our local communities is something that I'm particularly interested in. Um, yeah, that's where I'll, I'll start. How about you? Okay, um, um, I've never worked in a big organisation, in a big institution, so it's... Is this on? It is. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so it's difficult for me to be able to comment on the other side, but I've worked in a Hackney Museum, which is um, three and a half people, and Black Cultural Archives, which I think was about four, five, when we opened it. Um, so two very small... Um, organizations but organizations that are very kind of larger group of people around them helping to kind of shape programming and exhibitions and projects um, and to steer the direction of those organizations very responsive to um, the needs of the community but absolutely no money so having to um, be very creative in how we how we tell stories and, and the stories that we tell I mean being institutions in a public space you know, and having a public remit to engage communities. Um, what is it that you uh, are both seeking to achieve then in the work you present? I mean, is there an agenda for change, for example? There's always an agenda question. for change. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I mean, that, I, for coming from a small organisation, um, I've worked at Hackney Museum for 14 years, um, and that's always been my agenda. So I don't know whether that's why it's the agenda of the museum, because there aren't that many people in it. But um, for me, that's what museums have to be. Um, the children and the families that I encounter in Hackney have extremely diverse histories. So the museum always had to be a museum about the history of migration and the history of, of those families. Otherwise, it's irrelevant for the community. And it's a, a local authority museum, so we have to be. They're, they're paying for us to be there, so it has to be a museum for them. So, I mean, for me, that's the agenda is to, for anyone that comes into the museum to realise where their story fits in the, in the kind of long history of Hackney and migration to Hackney, but then kind of within British history as well. Because if you can't do that, then you have young people that, that don't know where their story fits. And that doesn't just give them problems in learning history later on. That's huge problems with identity and belonging and um, all of that. So it sounds like, you know, Hackney is the people's museum. Um, yeah. Well, it's, the, it's our people's museum. It's not the, <laughs> the people who have found us and that we've found. It's become the museum for those, those people, I suppose. So the starting point for your museum is to represent stories of the local community with a strong focus on African-Caribbean communities. And in Liverpool uh, museums, and you're working in the Slavery Museum, um, you're del delivering the Sankofa project, um, What's your experience of um, having the power to make the change in a, in a bigger institution then? 
Um, so I am actually just at the start of the project, but I, having worked in the education team for the Slavery Museum, we did have more freedom within within our, that was a small team of three. So sometimes working, working with a smaller group of people who have similar ideas um, and a similar agenda is helpful. But when you're in a big organisation, sometimes that isn't always the message. And also when you're looking at different pots of funding and people are working on so many different projects, it can be difficult especially when your your funding's like there's a threat of your fun, your funding being cut as well um, but yeah I think it's moving forward with the Sankofa project and um, the idea is that we're doing a collections re review as well of the waterfront museum so as well as um, the slavery museum looking at the maritime museum and looking at the museum of Liverpool and embedding black heritage um, across the organization essentially um, so it not being an add-on but having those voices and those stories being told throughout our collections. Um, next year we're doing a big um, push on an exhibition called Black Salt because we've realised um, that representation in our, particularly in our Maritime Museum which is like 30 years old now, it, it needs updating, it needs those new voices coming through. Um, so yeah, it is, it's definitely on our agenda um, but it's making sure it's on and it's definitely on my agenda, but it's making sure it's a it's an organisational thing as well. Because I'm happy to push push it through, but when it's such a big organisation, sometimes that can be can take a little bit longer for for things to to come to the forefront. And so, if museums are the you know uh, public space that represent histories and stories, um, how 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 are you ensuring that? You know, for, I mean, from different perspectives here. Um, because it's, it's um, almost chalk and cheese in a small unit that can operate and very agile to a bigger institution. How are you ensuring that you're embedding community engagement and the voice of the local communities? Um, for me, it's doing a lot of community outreach and just putting the message out because the Sankofa project is um, to support um, community groups and individuals in archiving their own collection, so not necessarily for the museums to hold, but for them to be out in the community and just kind of raise awareness and um, and support people. Um, that might sound a little bit wishy-washy, but it's just starting those conversations and and finding out what how, what support people actually need in our in our local community, um, and then we can better address how we can support them and how their stories might fit into to the work that we're doing in the museum. And I love the work of um, of Hackney Museum and really their education programme and embedding those voices in, in the teaching that they do. So we haven't got, we haven't, we're not quite there in, um, in the Museum of Liverpool and, and the Slavery Museum. It's not quite in, embedded in our, in our learning programme, but that's something that we can work on and, and develop, I hope. So there's something to learn for the big institution from the, the li small organisation. Absolutely. Is there, much, is, there, is there an exchange the other way? I, the small organisation learning from the bigger organisation? The money's always nice. It <laughs> comes from the bigger organisation. Money! But we're careful about yes. where we take it from. We won't just take money from anywhere, because it often comes right. with um, support. We, we had a conversation actually after the last panel about sponsorship mm -hmm. and whether you take money from certain organisations that might try to censor some of the material that you're talking about. Actually bringing it back to what we're here to talk about, um, enslavement and abolition, um, it's quite interesting. We um, we work very closely with Kate and Christy on the um, Legacies of British Slave Ownership project. Um, and it was a really important project for us because with our Abolition 07 exhibition, our main focus on that, we, the guidance that we took from the community was that we want to retrieve the hidden um, African stories from Hackney because they haven't been told, which was absolutely our mission from the start. Um, and we did that quite successfully. We went into the archives and we retrieved material about that. Um, however, one of the criticisms that was raised about the exhibition that I completely support and actually I agree with, but wasn't even taken into consideration at the time, was it kind of goes with the statue, the covering up the statue debate do agree with because um, the Legacies of Slave Ownership project has revealed the huge, I mean we knew it anyway, but the people in Hackney who have built Hackney and where that money came from and those connections um, to the slave trade and the money that was on the, the wealth in Hackney that came from people like John Cass who was trading in people, the Royal African Company. So 
John Cass, his history of a philanthropist, setting up educational institutions, that's what Hackney knew him as. That he's, we've, got na we've got street roads named after him, you know, um, schools and colleges and, and institutions. So um, to kind of, could we work with any of those, organ could we take money from any of the John Cass? I don't, I don't know, but what's really interesting is, and it's something that Katie um, says in her PhD, is that, and I've not thought about it before, but we've got Castleham Road, um, and you walk 20 minutes, and you end up on Windrush Close. So the people in Hackney are walking around this history all the time, the history, the immediate history, and the history that isn't that far in the past. Um, mm. But... It, it, it's our role as a museum to bring that history to the fore and to talk about it. So in so doing and knowing this and your public knowing this and audiences and participants who go through your education programmes, what does it inspire in the public? I mean, in terms of awareness, in terms of action, uh, consciousness, do you see that? Does that un unravel um, in the um, shifting of policy in your organisation or the um, challenging of the curriculum at school uh, and so forth? Do you get to see those end results, those big macro things? Um, and what are the kind of micro stories then of the people who participate in these programs um, in terms of the museum representing um, these histories um, and finding out actually where they live um, has been funded by uh, potentially, well, a criminal if, uh, if slavery is banned in the 21st century? even though it's historical? Um, from, from doing the education sessions and, and engaging with secondary mainly when we're talking about transatlantic mm. slavery, um, a lot of them surprise because they come to it as, as the start of their learning. Yeah. Um, and, and yet and local schools can be really like, oh God, all those streets are named after slave traders. That can, that can be a big surprise for them. Um, but then I think, like, like Emma was saying, it's so important to see it, all those, there's so many physical legacies in, in the city of Liverpool that you can, you can walk around and there's, there's so many names and so many... Gold in our collections. Um, the whole of my Objects of Resistance session that I do with primary schools is based on one thing. I don't know if, Katie, you found it or whether it was found as part of another project, but we've got this letter that um, somebody wrote in 1791 and it basically says... Um, I can't despair because the young people of Hackney have given up sugar, um, a great indulgence to them and are taking to the streets to protest against slavery from the 1700s. Like, that is gold dust in a school session and that is how um, we bring the... How, how we take it away from... We do teach about... We try to take children on the whole journey from pre kind of pre-slavery Africa right up to now, where we are now, which is quite huge. Um, but that's where we end it, with the now bit, and look at, look at how young people have played a part in bringing about the end of slavery, and what could you do, what do you do in your school? Do you campaign in your school? And then the kids, because they're quite young, will say, well, we're really lucky that we don't have slavery anymore, and black people really like white people, and um, what, and then we kind of say, well, you know, it does still happen around the world and move them forward. So we're moving away from what our ancestors did and moving forwards in a kind of collective action to together on issues that, are, that we face in the world still today. So it's using that journey to teach about where we are now. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, from our point of view in the panel, the um, subject matter is very important. Perhaps for the audience, um, perhaps just perhaps reiterate why this um, uh, whole subject matter is, is important then in the 21st century, knowing that um, you know, communities are very diverse in Hackney, Liverpool, in our major cities now. Um, how does the story resonate in the 21st century, the transatlantic slavery movement and its objects? <coughs> So I think it is, it is really important, as particularly when you're working with younger people, to make right. it as relevant as possible to them. And bringing that story bang up to date is, um, is really important. Um, we have a lot of temporary exhibitions in, our, in the legacy section of our gallery, so our story also starts with, um, 
West Africa um, before the arrival of Europeans and kind of moves on to um, forced migration, looking at plantation life and then a big pushes on legacies but also um, contemporary campaigning we've done exhibitions with autograph and anti-slavery international um, talking about kind of um, slavery that ex still exists today um, and more contemporary campaigns as well and we we do that with our our younger groups um, looking at activism today as well so so I think they they can find it um, really empowering that that they it's not they're not just coming to a session and learning facts, but they are getting to interpret things and getting to question things, um, and yeah, and, and form their own opinions. We're giving them stuff and like, what, what do you think of this? Like, how how do you how do you engage with this? Um, and then saying, well, if you really wanted to do something about it, you could. <laughs> Can I ask a question around um, who it's for? In the in the sense that if you're going down a route of education on such a complex subject matter, which is actually quite torturous to think about what happened and, and uh, how, it was, how people were exploited for profit. Um, where do you make a decision as to who you engage and at what age? <laughs> I think this is where we um, differ because we've taken the decision to only address the, the kind of full transatlantic slavery story with um, history with um, secondary schools so we don't we we don't really look at it with primary schools because it is so heavy um, and we do a lot of object handling so I, I wouldn't personally feel comfortable looking at things like um, shackles or neck irons with um, kind of 10 or 11 year olds so, um, so I think we've we've drawn the line and the distinction to, to do that and um, and look more at kind of culture or, or Activism with with younger students. Emma, you have a different view. <laughs> um, we took our cue from the people that we spoke to in, in 2007, and we spoke to a lot of people um, and had a lot of uncomfortable conversations um, that needed to happen. Um, and the outcome of those uncomfortable conversations is that people wanted to have more uncomfortable conversations, um, and not just older people in the community who felt their lives. Um, have been obviously touched and affected by what happened in the past, but they wanted their families to know and they wanted their children to know and they didn't have the language and the objects and the resources to teach about it themselves at home. The same with teachers, it's been removed from the curriculum. Teachers, not all teachers, we've got an amazing teacher in the room who you might hear from later or not, um, but we've got some incredible teachers who, who learn about the history and, and teach it in an amazing way and there's some photographs of them um, doing so in the, in the display, but the teachers that we spoke, we had to start, and our young people about why they're here, still in Africa, we were and they, they needed to that, um, and we have a session that, that does that in the most sensitive way that we possibly can, and it's a session that dares to take young people um, on the journey. Um, we, we cover, like I said, pre-slavery, we cover the, the slave forts, um, enslavement, the Middle Passage, plantations, um, and then resistance, and that's that's where the session um, really kind of comes to its fore, looking at the resistance movement and rebellion, and how people fought back, and how people resisted in the Caribbean and in the UK, um, and using that energy that comes from the where you've taken those children to, that place that you've taken them to, and you've really made them fit. They they can't ever imagine what it was like. I'm not trying to say that they can, but if you children have an amazing capacity to um, engage really deeply with history but they have to feel it to know how to respond and to come up with those um, solutions and, and really to activate it so we do take them there knowing that they're in a safe space and that we're going to leave them on a real kind of positive action um, that they will then take back to school with the teacher so it's about it's about teaching sensitively, but it's also about really taking care of teachers and families by doing not just the school sessions, but by having family sessions and having teaching resources, which we write as well, trying to kind of support that whole network around those young people's understanding of that subject, if that makes sense. No, totally. I mean, the issue around safe space comes to mind. I mean, because you're, you're talking about complex um, subject matter that could, you know, um, is quite disturbing and creating that safe space and that the right techniques and methods uh, are, are absolutely critical. 
in, in that process. It's interesting because we did a project uh, with Galleries of Justice called Get Up Stand Up and we did a session with schools, primary children, where four children were created as masters and the rest slaves and the slaves had to plead for their freedom as, a, as an exercise. Um, and it's interesting, there was one boy who pleaded for his release as a slave and they, I think he was eight years old, nine years old, but he got into the subject matter so much that he was in tears in that process. So it's, it's really about method um, and you know, as much as the subject is difficult, um, it's about the methodology used to get into the truth of the matter, but without creating um, a disturbing, long-lasting impact. Yeah, and I think, it, like you say, it's about the frame and the context that you put around it. So we teach through poetry. So we have um, a poet that comes in um, and takes them on that journey, and they respond and they reflect all the way through, and then they write their own poems at the end. Um, using everything that they've written. So there's kind of a lens that, that they go on that journey through. We're not asking them necessarily to, to be those people, but we're asking them to put themselves into, I don't know, into that position. Like, how would you feel if this was taken away from right. you? I mean, it's interesting because both of you are exemplar in the work you do and great examples for us to learn from. What is your experience then of the museums across the country? Um, in terms of uh, the subject matter of transatlantic slavery and its representation, because already we've heard that it's no longer part of the curriculum um, in, in the previous session and just what you said. Um, what is your experience of, of the subject matter then um, being part of the everyday museum? I'm not saying you're not everyday museums because you're a future-facing museum. Do you have an experience? Um, I don't want you to bite anyone, but or name anyone, but just generally, is there a, are there issues around the museum sector in terms of what it represents and how it represents? I see, um, when, when we were doing the research for the 2007 exhibition, I went and visited um, a museum. Um, I'm not going to say which one, but I went to visit a museum and watched one of their secondary school sessions. Um, and the young people were handling leg irons, um, and the teachers were taking photographs of the young people ha handling the leg irons. Um, and the, t the people, I, I went with someone from the Hackney Ethnic Minority Achievement Service because we were thinking about like how we wanted to put together a session. Um, and we were, um, the kids were allowed to kind of just freely move around the material and there was no frame, there was no structure, there was joking around. I mean, no, nobody was being racist, but people were joking. It just felt so wrong. Um, and. After that, we visited a few other museums to see how not to do it, to work out how we <laughs> were going to do it. Um, but again, I think it comes down to kind of the project funding thing. We're all victims in museums of kind of trying to get little pockets of money, and then we fall into that trap you know, that Ingrid raised about working with the fashionable groups to work with. We just work with the people that come. Museums are... We, we are subject to that kind of funding. It's precarious times for museums and we rely on that, that funding, so it's, it's very difficult to kind of, yeah, I don't know. So I think people are doing the best that they can, but there are those other factors around it, like funding, that um, will affect how deep a museum is able to go into its community and do something. Um, um, not necessarily about a particular organisation, but across the sector I find um, Museums aren't necessarily the most diverse in terms of their workforce, mm -hmm. um, like really badly. <laughs> um, so that's something that I'd I'd really like to see us address as a as a big organisation, and I think it's something that we could we could have an impact on. Um, yes. Yeah, so and increasingly, there's um, there will be more pressures on bigger institutions to play a more active role in. Uh, the creative case for diversity. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that's um, with the NPOs, which are national portfolio organisations, which not in contemporary is a new art exchanges, and the MPNs, which are the museum networks, um, have come together on, as one and arts council now. So there's this whole creative case for diversity. Um, what's your experience of that in your museum? It's not great. Right. Um, 
yeah, in our in our kind of small team working at the Slavery Museum, it's slightly more diverse. Right. But in terms of a big organisation, we're not diverse at all. Um, but then it's it, uh, I'm not sure if it's people facing barriers, kind of even getting into organisations like museums because there's so um, there's so much kind of popularity to kind of work with in 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 the sector. So it's just I. I worry about the barriers that people face and if they're put off by kind of um, the way that we work as well. So with the Sankofa project I'm hoping to um, bring in some positive action policies right. with our, starting with our volunteers but then also with the, with the people that we're working with. Because um, I think that that's really important and having that different, those different voices um, and I can see it written on this page, the community voices as well um, is, is key. Well, if the community is represented, surely, in a museum, and there, there's a, a genuine desire to tell the stories of those communities. And there is a bias in, in one's culture to gravitate towards those stories. Um, and there is a consciousness um, of, uh, of curators and people who um, design projects to to deal with a point of action. And that's something that's coming across with the work of Hackney and Slavery Museum. Mm. Well, yeah, and I think it comes down to the fact that if you don't see your story reflected in, in an institution, why would you ever consider working there or wanting to go back there? Um, which I think is why, I mean, it's taken us a long time. We've been in Hackney for 14 years. Um, and it's only in the last few years that young people have started to put down Hackney Museum as an option for work experience. So we're getting quite a diverse um, lot of young people desperate to come and work in the museum. They didn't before, but I don't think um, it's taken a long time to establish ourselves at the heart of the community for those young people who first came to the museum when they were children and kept coming back with their schools and with their secondary schools and with their families. It's taken a long time to kind of change that way of thinking in Hackney that actually a museum could be somebody, somewhere where diverse you, you have a diverse workforce because the stories that we're telling is di di are diverse, if that makes sense. I mean, before we open it out to the audience, uh, one final question for me is, I suppose, about creating a space that's relevant. Um, and with all the distractions that we've got in today's world, you know, whether it's social, our own personal sort of profiles on social media, etc., cetera, um, and we're competing with so much, you know, digitization of, of television uh, and niche kind of consumerism. Um, how are you both responding to this context? in terms of engaging then um, communities on a, on, a, on a subject matter or a story, a journey that needs to be told. Sorry, do you mean competing with kind of digital and Yeah, so, so what, what, you know, if you talk about sort of engaged people, because you've talked about, you know, the museum is now a destination for young people. Um, some of it's obviously come through the projects and, and so forth. Um, but it is, are you venturing into the digital realm yourselves? No. <laughs> we don't have any money. Um, we're very active. We, we are a council museum. We have a rubbish council website, so don't look at it. It won't tell you anything about us. Find us on Facebook or Twitter. We're very active on Facebook and Twitter. We're starting to get into Instagram and things. But no, absolutely not. Our technology is rubbish. We've never engaged young people by sticking an iPad in front of them because we can't do that. We've never had the money. So it's, it, it's in the value of having the sugar letter, right. the protest material that we've got from the past. It's, it's the gold dust in the collections. Right. Finding that and then finding the right people to bring that alive with young people. No, we're not, I'm not saying it's not the right way to go because we probably do need to move into the Great. 21st century. But Great we answer. can't. We've got no money. Yeah, the, the gold dust and getting the sugar. So, Mitty, um, from your point of view, because you, you are on this digital journey. We do, we do have a bit more money. You've got more money. Um, so I am keen keen to increase accessibility by digitizing um, and also looking back at because we did we are uh, a lot of our um, temporary exhibitions mm -hmm. involved a bit more community and when we had like funding for particular projects so I'd love to see that online um, and just a, a kind of um, a bigger push to engage communities with with um, and share things online as well so with the archive material that I'm hopefully hopefully people will bring forward, it'd be great to kind of for them to have a space on our website because it is a kind of national 
museums in Liverpool. So for them to see that as a space for them too. Great. And Hull are putting together um, a hub for resources um, for teaching about enslavement and abolition and resistance. But I don't know, we might be hearing about that later. Um, but yeah, that's a really good place to look for stuff online. I'm hoping we've got loads of questions. Thank you, Emma Mitty. So, um, we've got about five minutes for questions. Um, are there any questions? There's a question here, and then a question over there. So we'll start here, and then go to there. Over here. <laughs> Perhaps say who you are and where you're from and all the rest. My name's Sarah Thomas, I teach at Birkbeck in Kingston, and I'm interested in the imagery of slavery. I'm, I'm an art historian. But my question is about uh, museum objects. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that um, objects in uh, slave collections tend to focus on atrocity. We, we have these metal objects that, that you see in every... Uh, slavery exhibition and of course you saw the, the image by Stedman of the, the slave um, being tortured there which gets repeated again and, and is in itself problematic and, and focuses on uh, the, the atrocities of, of slave history which of course is important to, to tell but it's not the only story and my question is how are you as um, museum curators uh, thinking about addressing or talking about the everyday quotidian life of, of slaves and, and do you find it difficult? I mean, there is a, a paucity of, of objects that address issues of, of resistance and as well as everyday life, is there not? And how, how do you work around those difficulties? Oh, wait. <laughs> cool. um, okay, mine's quite a quick answer. Um, we use music in our session. We use music, um, we, d we use um, resistance, I can't think of the word of the songs that we use. Um, and we use contemporary music as well. And we ask young people to reflect on the meaning behind words in songs. So we interrupt um, the object handling and the story with, with music that the young people respond to by thinking about kind of what would have been going on in people's heads in the, the daily we kind of fill in the gaps with with by using music and poetry um, and ask them to imagine um, and the other thing that I was going to say oh yeah it, it comes back to what Ingrid was saying about reimagining those gaps in history um, and yeah it is challenging um, because we don't have the material to tell those stories um, but we do have some amazing material in, in kind of the black cultural archives they've got um, slave runaway slave notices um, looking at some of the women that escaped into the communities and, and getting the kids to imagine those lives just because we don't it, just because it doesn't describe her daily life doesn't mean that with that description of her those young people can't imagine why she fled what she did who who she went and found how that then kind of formed communities in 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 London so it's a lot of it is filling the gaps with the imagination, because we, we just do not have a very big collection at the museum um, to draw on, unfortunately. But we do have lots of kind of creatives, and, and yeah, so we kind of lean on that a little bit. So we are lucky enough to have um, narratives of enslaved people that are featured on gallery really heavily, um, and the resistance and those voices are a really big part of our collections and something that we do include in our, um, in our education sessions, um, and that goes right from um, um, looking at kind of before transatlantic slavery um, and looking at the richness of culture in Africa and, um, and looking at forms of resistance that they, forms of, of culture that might have been used later on as forms of resistance and things like that. So it is something that we definitely address. Take one more question, then we'll get to the tables. Uh, there was a question here, um, just there, just by you, Katie. Hi, Paul Sharrett. I work in marketing and I live in Nottingham. I'm very interested in, um, you were talking about um, the lack of representation um, in institutions and also 
thinking about your archives and the richness of your archives and communicating that to new audiences. And I think because I work in marketing, I'm very interested that there's a, a layer of representation missing in, in local marketing. And I, I think I feel very strongly that we need to be asking the questions about you had a beautiful, um, the Hackney had a beautiful sort of representation of streets. That there was an image of, of colonial streets. And I'm wondering who's, what media is available to ask the questions about, well, what are the contemporary versions of those streets now? And the questions that should be asked about that process is still going on, the naming is still going on, but that, that questioning <coughs> from the community isn't being asked and, and institutions aren't being made accountable. So you can be a very positive organization, but in actual fact, the effect of your organization, unless it's made accountable by the local community and by local media that really works, it, it, nothing is going to change. Do you know what I mean? Does that make any sense? Sorry. I'm so, not so, what are the so say for example you've got streets, so Jamaica Street. Yeah. We've got one in Nottingham, but there must be naming going on now in new estates. The pe the power that makes the names is still there, okay. but it's not accountable in these new structures, which are talking about the past and not relating it to a present that is still enslaving people. And is there a media that is actually helping people ask those questions so that they can make it accountable and connect those archives of the past and resources to the present that they actually people actually experience and give them a sense of you know meaning in their local local environment so they feel grounded in their own locality yeah those streets why are those streets being named why is there an electric avenue in nottingham and there's one in beeston what does electric avenue mean for example I mean, this comes down to um, perhaps the moment we're in. I mean, sort of the, the conscious activist versus the um, apathetic kind of citizen. So it's about spaces like here, um, libraries, museums, creating sort of active programs that begin to ask these questions. I think that's all we can do um, when it comes to issues around transatlantic slavery or the topic around slavery. Again, this is a, a subject matter that needs to be um, um, highlighted as an important subject matter, whether it's for the curriculum um, or whether it's represented in museums. And it's these spaces where um, that kind of conscious citizen is born. So we've got some work to do. We need more resources, there's no doubt. Um, but we need to think on that macro level as well. Right, so we're going to move on. Um, because we can get in and pin them up on that wall and then we'll summate at the end. So we've got about 10 minutes. Thanks.
give a, a, a kind of orientation to this, um, yeah. and I'll let everyone know that um, we do not have Robin. Um, no, we don't have Abdul. Uh, sorry. <laughs> we do not have Abdul. We've got um, Robin. And we also do not have, we don't have Lisa. at least Lisa. Yeah. Um, All these mics are live. Yeah. This one's live too. Hello, everyone. Um, if I can ask everyone to please take your seats, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with the next session. You know, finish your conversations, relax, um, come back to us. So this is the session that is on um, slavery and education. Um, my name is Karen Salt. I am um, affiliated with the University of Nottingham. Now, <laughs> I've already heard from some in the room that was like, when did that happen? Um, I was previously at the University of Aberdeen. Um, I work on issues around race, rights, and sovereignty. Um, a significant portion of my work looks at how racialized attitudes about difference um, influences decision making amongst communities um, and especially nations. And so I spent a lot of time working around Haiti, Liberia, and Abyssinia. Um, and uh, understanding the ways that these um, self-avowed black nations have existed um, and the way that that existence actually troubles quite a bit about uh, global politics and flows of power. Um, but I am not here to talk about myself. I am here now to chair this session and um, I, I'm already going to issue a series of apologies um, uh, for the fact that you only have the two of us. We are amazing people, but there are there were other amazing people who are also supposed to be with us, and um, and they are not with us. Um, as you will see up on the list here, um, Abdul Mohammed uh, was also supposed to be here with Robin, um, and he is here in spirit because um, he is his name is up on a. Uh, that's that's how I imagine it. Your name up on the PowerPoint. You are here in spirit, um, and unfortunately is um, is ill. And uh, Lisa Palmer, who was also going to join us, um, who's at BCU, um, had a family emergency. So she's unable to be with us today. So we will we'll try to hold the fort um, and make them proud uh, without their presence. Um, I'm going to turn things over. We're going to shake things up slightly differently um, as compared to the rest of the sessions. I'm going to turn things over to Robin, who actually has a bit of a, uh, of a prepared talk for you to just encapsulate the sort of wealth of, of, of the educational program that he and Abdul um, uh, are spearheading. Um, and then I'm going to ask him a series of questions. And once those questions are done, we may open up the questions to audience. We'll see where you are at at that moment, if you've got some burning things that you want to pose directly to Robin. But otherwise, we think we might actually just set the provocation to, to allow you to have more time at your tables um, to talk amongst yourselves, to really think through the problematics um, and some of the, the, the sort of weavings of, um, of, the, of this issue. So I'm going to turn it over now. You're welcome. Thanks, Karen. Is this working? Yeah, it is. Um, Sometimes in, in schools, we talk about uh, the role of a historian being a little bit like a detective. Um, I'm a bit worried that this is the case of the disappearing historians, um, and it's only me left, and I'm not sure who's coming for me. Um, and I really do apologize if one of your favorite characters was Abdul or Lisa, and they've got killed before I did. Um, <laughs> please don't hate on that, yeah? Okay. Um, it's, it's sad that I'm the only person left, but I will try um, to, as we say, Abdul and I say, we try to do justice to history. Um, Abdul and I have been working together now for about five years, and for three years, the last three years, we've had uh, a consultancy called Justice to History. And so our, our question um, for you is, how can we do justice to the teaching of new world slavery? That's the slavery of the Americas, the slavery of enslaved Africans who were taken across the Atlantic uh, to the New World. For myself, I've, I taught school history for about 30 years in North London, and I tried not to teach very much about the transatlantic slave trade. My, my preference in our curriculum was to teach a lot about Africa, a lot about African empires, a lot about resistance, a lot about resistance in Africa, Queen Nzinga, um, 
and in the Caribbean, we talk about Sam Sharp and Nanny and these characters. But the actual trade itself was something that we tried to avoid because we wanted to avoid the negativity that we felt was present in that whole history. And I'm now working in history education, so I'm training teachers now. So I have people who come to me as prospective history teachers and it saddens me when they come and they, they pitch a lesson. They have to tell me about a lesson that they would teach in school. And they'll pitch a lesson about the slave trade. And I'll say, well, that was very interesting. Why did you choose that topic? And several of these trainee, prospective trainees, will say, well, I think it's really important to do something for the black kids. And my heart just sinks. I think... Do you really think that this is what is going to actually do something, whatever that means? Um, people certainly haven't made use of the work of Dr. K. Trail, who in the UK researched the impact of those kind of histories on African Caribbean families in London. And her, the results of her research were to say that this, this is really damaging to young African Caribbean people. Why are you perpetuating this kind of history? So that's part of the reason why we kind of steered away from it. But when we came to actually write a book about teaching black history in secondary schools, um, no, no kind of, we don't like doing this kind of publicity, but it is, it is out now. Um, when we came to do that book, we actually didn't have a chapter on slavery and the slave trade. We had a chapter on Africa, we had a chapter on South Africa, one on uh, the Caribbean, one on black British history and so on, and African American civil rights, but we didn't have a chapter on slavery until about three months before the, the manuscript was due. And then we said to ourselves, you know what, this is crazy, because this is what people teach. If people teach slavery and the slave trade, why are we not writing about it? But the problem was we hadn't actually taught it well ourselves because we hadn't engaged in that. So we set ourselves the task of trying to come up with a historical inquiry about teaching slavery in the slave trade from scratch. What, would, what should it actually look like? Um, and we've made an attempt at that. And because we're now, we're not actually in schools all the time. We teach sometime in schools. We have to rely on our, our teacher colleagues to teach our inquiries. And some people have already taught this particular inquiry. So I can talk to you about what they, um, what they have done. But I just thought I'd give you, to, just to begin with, a little bit of background about this teaching of slavery in uh, English schools. When did it all begin? Well, the national curriculum began in 1991. And when the national curriculum came out, one of the optional units was a unit called Black Peoples of the Americas. And if you look at this book, this was the textbook that was published in 1991, the moment the curriculum came out. The, 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 the whole thing began with the slave trade. Now, when we looked at it, in fact, in the school I was working in, we actually, we changed the unit and said, no, we want a unit that says black peoples from Africa to America. And we began with Ghana and Mali and Songhai and the kingdoms, and then we moved forward. But this book didn't do that. And so a lot of schools taught like this. They began African people's experience with the slave trade with slavery, and then they moved forward uh, through the civil war and segregation and civil rights. In 2007, it actually became compulsory to teach about the slave trade and slavery. That was actually changed in 2013, so it's no longer the case. So for this brief period of time, six years, it was actually compulsory to teach about slavery and the slave trade in English schools. It was, a lot of it was to do with the work of, in, in the House of Commons of David Lammy, who actually campaigned to say uh, this should actually be a compulsory subject. So only the Holocaust and the slave trade were compulsory subjects. Now it's only the Holocaust. The slave trade is not, no longer compulsory to teach. And so when they actually, when they put it forward to teach the slave trade, they said it's compulsory, and in the, what, what they have in the curriculum are guidance notes. 
And the guidance notes said that when you do this, you should teach about West African kingdoms. You ought to do that. But it wasn't compulsory. And of course, our friend textbook was still out. The book that was published in 1991 is still being published. And it makes no reference to the African kingdoms. So the book didn't change. And so what happens in schools? Nothing changed. But it was compulsory now to teach this. So the kind of topic became compulsory, but there wasn't sufficient work going on behind the scenes to actually say, well, what, what does it mean to teach this well? How should it be taught? That wasn't being done. And so you end up with really, frankly, a travesty taking place in many classrooms. I was just saying to Karen that, you know, I've actually seen even one of my trainees in a school um, gather her girls in the class. She's teaching an all-girls school. She gathered up the girls and she marched them into the history stock cupboard. And she said, we're doing this to see what it was like to be on the Middle Passage. Teachers who actually get their children to go under the desk. Or another young man who came to, to pitch a lesson for his application and said, I'd get the students to stand shoulder to shoulder in the middle of the room. And people are doing these kinds of things because they, I think they are well, I, I'm not doubting that they're not well-meaning teachers. Absolutely no doubt that, that they feel that this is, this, this is a good thing to do. But they haven't thought through the issue. And there hasn't been enough work done um, in the academy or in teacher training to actually think about how should we teach these sorts of issues. And so, um, in our book in 2016, we did end up with a chapter about teaching transatlantic slavery. And we actually put it first in the book. It was after the introduction. It was the first chapter. It's not the first thing we wanted to happen in schools, but it was the kind of the way of saying to teachers, we know you do this. Can you please just read this and think a bit more about it? And just in case... We're kind of thinking that things have moved on and we no longer have to think about these issues. Um, somebody actually came to me with this photo um, the other day. And I don't show you this in, in sort of sensationalism, but just show you this to show the depth of problems that there are, I imagine, all around the country in teaching this particular topic. We can't actually... Oh. The lighting is... And is there any way that the lighting can be switched off? No? Yeah? So this is a classroom that has lots of nice display boards. And um, on one side is um, a, a, a poster that shows all the evils of slavery. But on this poster, the heading was, Slaves have a good life. So the, uh, the concept was to have, I imagine, the concept was to have like a balance. And we talk about having a balanced view in history. So the idea was to have some kind of balance. But some of the things, if we highlight this, this was the one that re uh, I just, all of them were appalling. But right in the middle, there was a source and it said, making the slaves much more disciplined. And that that was the impact of slavery. Now, you might think, okay, we might think, first of all, that this was possibly um, take a picture taken in the 1980s or the 1960s. This is a picture taken in 2016. And then you might say, well, okay, well, but this is a classroom somewhere out in the countryside. This is a rural um, a classroom and so forth where they haven't thought through these issues at all. No, this is actually a school in the most multicultural borough of London where the school is extremely diverse, lots of people from all sorts of different backgrounds. And yet there are teachers who are thinking, this is all right, this is actually good history because we're taking a balanced view. We would actually argue that to do justice to some history, a balanced view does not mean there is an even amount of good and bad on each side. And we all know that there are some topics for which that would never be considered. No one would ever talk about some history topics in the way that, well, yes, there has to be a balanced view. People accept that there are some 
experiences and events and happenings in history that are unequivocally bad, evil even. And we would argue that this, that's true of the transatlantic slave trade. There isn't a balance sheet of, of good and bad. But teachers do have a, a, a challenge with this. And the challenge, as I said earlier, is that there just hasn't been the kind of background um, be, being done, the research being done to prepare people. So just a little bit about what we did. Um, where do you begin? Well, what we chose to do with the transatlantic slave trade and slavery, we chose to begin with the notion of race. I've actually seen that there, that there was a classic uh, complaint made in a London school where actually the, the, the history department taught the slave trade as an economic activity, as a business activity. They actually set up a dragon's den connected to the slave trade. We don't believe that the way to teach this is to start with economics, but to start with trade. The way is to start with race. And we actually begin with the whole notion of racial profiling. Um, both these uh, eminent African-American men suffered from racial profiling. Colin Powell was challenged at an airport um, and Henry Louis Gates, you may remember, was actually arrested in his house uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and in the end, he and uh, the policeman concerned had tea at the White House. It was one of the first things that President Obama did when he took office. So we introduced the students to this idea. And the question is, has it always been like this? And we look back at the Middle Ages, we look back at this uh, statue of St. Maurice, who was actually the patron saint of the Holy Roman Empire. And he's clearly an African warrior. He was, a, he was an African warrior in the Roman army. And he's chosen as the patron saint of the Holy Roman Empire in the Middle Ages. So it suggests that ideas about race and racism and racial inferiority were not, were not prevalent. They, they didn't predominate in the Middle Ages. So where did they come from? And we get the students to ask that question. And the actual inquiry question that we put forward then is, how far did New World slavery, the actual process of slavery, turn Africans into Negroes? What is the problem? We talk about that word with the students. We talk about what the word Negro meant. And Certainly, uh, there are a number of academic historians who would, who would say that it wasn't, the slave trade didn't happen because people were racist, but people became racist because of the slave trade. Slavery brought that racism. One of the people that we've um, looked to for, for a, a kind of guidance in that is Professor Trevor Bernard, who talks about the idea that actually Africans down at the very bottom, Africans went on board the slave ship of Africans and emerged in the new world as Negroes, that the process of slavery changed these people. But also he talks about it as a, um, as a dehumanizing process. But I know Karen's going to ask me a question uh, which will enable me to explain. So that's probably a, a good place to stop and let Karen come in. I think magically the lights will go back on, <clears throat> perhaps, maybe not. Um, oh yeah. I feel empowered that I was able to make that happen. Um, right, so thank you very much for that, um, Robin. I think it's probably um, uh, got the audience thinking quite a bit, um, hopefully to both um, question, challenge, think through, um, imagine what they might do differently um, but I do have a, four questions, I think. Um, you don't necessarily have to answer all of them, although I would prefer it. Um, and the first one, um, I, it actually came to me because I was really interested about doing justice to history. Um, I, I understand um, the notion of um, you know, the, the push at history and to understand what justice means, um, but I do a lot of work around justice, especially questions about um, reparative justice uh, and what does, how do you repair certain sets of relationships, because in some ways what we're talking about, about um, transatlantic slave trade and involves an incredible amount of complicated relationships between entities, with another people, families, um, nations, communities, um, and, and in some cases we've got now those legacies of those groups trying to inter, interact um, still. So this is not a question about the reparations movement per se, 
um, as much as it is um, how do we try to balance this justice work, if you will, um, given the amount of forces that are surrounding us, um, much less what you were describing before about um, the compulsory aspects of, of teaching and now the movement out of, but yet the, the, the struggles you're having to try to change the way people might go into teaching. Um, and I know this may seem a strange thing to sort of think through, but um, I can't help but think that sometimes our role as educators, no matter if we're in the community or if we're in our own families, is to repair damage or lack of knowledge or, um, or violence in some ways. And so I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are about justice. Um, the idea that, that history is something kind of dead and finished and gone is something that we would certainly um, ball cat and, and we, we want the work of history to actually be something that can impact on the present and the future. So I think the history of this, um, these, these things that happened is a, is a vital part of any notion of repairing the damage that's been done. So we, we would begin with the idea of perhaps restorative justice to history and mm -hmm. restoring the histories that have been removed. And that our, perhaps our contribution to the, to, the, to the debate about current affairs and future social justice, our contribution would be to provide people with the kind of historical knowledge and understanding that would enable them to do justice to the present and the future. Mm -hmm. So um, we, wouldn't want, we wouldn't want to be the people who debate the current and future um, issues, mm -hmm. but we would very much want to work in a kind of interdisciplinary way mm -hmm, sure. to, to, work, to provide um, in knowledge and understanding of history. Mm, no, definitely. Um, I think this gets me to my, my next question. Um, I don't know if anyone in the audience, um, there was, who, if you were at the earlier session talking uh, where the panelists were talking about um, handling objects, um, particular types of objects, whether or not they're manacles or various different things involved with um, uh, the transportation and movement of enslaved bodies. Um, but, I, but there's been a lot of work done um, amongst a whole range of historians uh, and other interdisciplinary scholars um, about the affect of actually dealing with this kind of material culture, if you will, the kind of residue, you know, what, what we like to imagine as if these things don't actually have that kind of um, emotional charge. Um, but in some ways, that's the reason why people are bringing them out is to sort of, you know, provoke something within people. Um, but there's been quite a bit of work done around lynching photographs, for example, um, about what is the appropriateness of actually displaying lynching photographs um, in a classroom or with young people. Um, what do you, how do you handle that? What do you do to try to communicate that level of violence um, as, as well as the apathy of, of the violence um, that's often transmitted within the photographs, right? Um, and I know that you've talked about a whole range of activities and you didn't get to all of the ones in your, in your PowerPoint presentation. Um, but I can imagine there has got to be an emotional, affective charge to doing this, um, no matter if you're talking about um, particular sets of kingdoms or other sets of, of, of other work. There's, there's, how do you, how are you, what, what tools do you have um, or what tools would you offer up to either students or teachers about handling, handling that? I'm not sure whether it's a tool, but I think, I think what, what you have to begin with is an understanding, and I think that's what this, this kind of understanding has helped us to actually accept that we have to teach about this, even <laughs> though it's sometimes it's negative and so on. You have to teach about this. And that's the fact that whatever you do in the classroom, there is actually um, a kind of, you might call it a folk culture or a street culture, which actually contributes to young people's apparent knowledge and understanding about 
the world, and particularly about Africa and about African issues and about slavery. Um, just, I mean, a little tiny example would be to say, because I had this kind of debate at the British Museum once, because um, the curator, one of the curators of the Africa Gallery said um, he didn't need to worry about race because they were only... That's I think that I was about five at the time. And his mum had to take him to Nigeria because he refused to accept that African people didn't live in mud huts. Despite the fact that he had professional African parents and so on, and he had a lovely school. I'm thinking, where did he get that notion from? And why was it so fixed in his mind? There are notions in the kind of playground and the street. And one of them is also about slavery. We have a friend of mine who's um, he probably, he's in his 20s now. He's an English teacher. But he talked about his experience of black history in the classroom. And he said he actually dreaded... The, the time when they were going to teach about black history in the classroom, because he knew that in the playground he would just get weeks of Kunta Kinte jokes, which is what happened. Um, and so we've got to be aware that there is a lot of um, sensitivity and there's a lot of a sort of harsh, well, cruel humour that goes on. And so when you're dealing with these topics, uh, it is important to think about how can you treat them sensitively and what, what, what sort of advice, what protocols do you have in the classroom for how it's just unnerving. So the more you can prepare the young people for that kind of thing, I think the better. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I would probably uh, use my chair's prerogative just to add that um, I would think that there's, there's some reckoning that needs to be made with the individuals teaching this work. Um, there's a lot of a lot of people can make assumptions that it's just super easy to to read about particular accounts or to display information or prepare lesson plans um, as if you do not have any emotional invest investment in the about the trade is that it, it is a complex messy violent business um, that imbricated a whole range of people into making all sorts of decisions um, to to survive or to make profit um, so I've got another question for Can you. I just, Go ahead. just sorry, Karen. Just to say, so when we when we tried to think, well, how are we going to teach the middle passage? What would we do with this? We can't. All the the attempts at empathy and those activities that you know well-meaning teachers are doing with the desks and the stock activity that they get students to do. Humanizing experience happen to them is so horrific that it's dehumanizing. So as a human, how do you understand that? You can't understand that. And so what we decided to try to do was to, not so much to look at the actual, um, the people who were on the boats, but the people who actually got off the boats at the end. I think sometimes the assumption is, well, okay, millions died, but you know, the, the, those who survived, well, they, they survived and they were alive. But what was it like to actually be somebody who had been through that. And our thoughts went to this, to the concept of, of post-traumatic stress disorder. And we were just wondering, what would it be like to actually have experienced the Middle Passage and then to try to carry on your life? And so what we did was to give the students some understanding of PTSD. So we went through the process. Uh, interestingly, there has been a precedent for this because um, a psychologist looked at Samuel Pepys and actually said um, the fire of London probably had this effect on him, judging from what he says in his diaries, um, that he probably was suffering from PTSD. So that, this could be something that people in the past have suffered from. And so we got the students to consider the evidence sources about the Middle Passage, but not in terms of what, was it, what would it have been like, but what, would, what impact might it have had on the people themselves. And we also looked at kind of modern advice that's given to people for coping with PTSD and to realize that none of that advice was possible for somebody who was made to work on a plantation. And so the impact of the Middle Passage was the thing that we mm -hmm. kind of concentrated on in terms of the, the enslaved African mm -hmm. experience. I guess I wouldn't want people to think that um, these are damaged individuals per se or, or get the impression that um, uh, 
that the, the trade didn't affect everyone. I mean, you, you know, there's, there's a glib moment where you could say empire is PTSD run rampant around the globe to a certain extent um, from the people who are, um, you know, inflecting their violence onto other people. Um, we'll leave that one for a minute. Um, it, this brings up a lot of questions to me about um, dreptomania. I don't know if any of you know about dreptomania. Dreptomania was a, a mental illness, um, a, a diet. An individual named Cartwright uh, created dreptomania, and dreptomania was a, as an illness uh, for slaves, enslaved persons who ran away. So it was used why people little echoes of, of, of trying to think through um, those issues. Um, but I want to leave one final thought before we turn everything to our groups to talk uh, further, is if you had um, everything in front of you to set up networks and um, consultations and partnerships of, of various different kinds, what, what would you like to see, either at the local level, at the national level? Um, what are the things that local, local historical associations can do? What are the things that some of the researchers in this room who've got amazing projects, what, what could they do that's, um, other than piecemeal types of work around particular projects that we all do? Um, if it was possible to gather um, funding that could actually um, develop research into the teaching of transatlantic slave trade. Well, not necessarily just, that's also a thing I'd have, I wouldn't just want it to look at the slave trade, but sure. actually, you know, we've, we've entered, I think it was last year, we've entered the United Nations decade mm -hmm. of people of African descent, and uh, not many people around the world seem to know that. Um, they had a year back in 2011, but then nobody knew about that, and so they've now tried a decade. But it seems like nobody knows about that either. But and, and there is a current movement to try to get the current prime minister to recognize this. Yeah, um, this and, and one of the things that could happen would be to actually establish a research uh, unit to look into mm -hmm. the teaching of the history of peoples of Africa and of African descent, which would embrace the slave trade, but it would go beyond that. Right. So it would be more than just teaching about slavery, it would be about teaching about Africa. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a, a very important thing. And mm -hmm. you know, that's like the most blue sky no, kind of thing. I mean, there's, there's, there's folks in here are probably going to take it on board and, yeah. and listen to it. I mean, um, I think the one thing I would want to add to that of, about the transatlantic is that um, people also think of what happened on the opposite side. <laughs> Um, of the movement of people going through parts of um, uh, the Indian Ocean, essentially, or over into um, Mauritius or even into India. Um, I don't know if any of you got to the Natural, National Portrait Gallery's um, exhibition just uh, not too long ago, um, which were of the Sidi. So there's 70,000 people of African descent in India. Um, and, and while many have essentially considered themselves um, uh, Hindu, it doesn't matter, but um, I feel connected, there is still a deep connection to um, certain groups or certain areas within Africa, but they are not really taught, even though um, when people talk about the slave trade, because it's not on the Atlantic, yeah. <laughs> essentially. Um, but something, I mean, that it, it's important to recognize, I think, and uh, I know Miranda Kaufman's here, and that her, um, or her conferences on what's happening in black British history, which started mm -hmm. two years ago. Um, since those conferences started, a, a lot has happened. Um, but to um, the one that um, I'm particularly involved with is the is the AQA's course on migration, empire, empires, and the people. Mm -hmm. um, and Abdul and I have written the textbook for Hodder um, on that particular course. And mm -hmm. there's a significant um, element of stuff about the trades mm -hmm. with Africa, mm -hmm. but not just the the slave. It starts with the slave trade with yeah. Africa, but then looks at what happens post slave trade and yes. what happens with um, the the palm oil trade yes. and the relationship with African. Uh, kingdoms and that's our kind of one of one of the, the sources that we use about Jar Jar of Apopo. So one thing that could happen would be um, for people to study 
the GCSE and make sure that schools, because mm. there's a temptation in schools just to keep doing what you've always done. Mm. Um, and the kind of one of the major competitors for this, and also not only this, the AQA course, the OCR board have done some excellent uh, syllabuses just on migration. Mm. So there's more than one option available. Mm. But so many schools are teaching medicine through time because that's something that's been done for the last 30 mm. years. And mm. so teachers feel under pressure and they're looking to just what have we done before mm. they're not embarking on new things mm. Mm. so encourage your schools get, get onto governing bodies and encourage the schools to to take up these new opportunities mm. that would be something they could do that's great so i think we're going to turn it over to you um i'm conscious of the time because that's uh, uh, somebody's in charge 20 minutes um, if we turn this over to you and your tables, um, uh, I know you have questions, um, store them. Um, and if we've got time, uh, we'll take 15 minutes now for the groups. And if we have time, we can present some stuff to, to Robin. Um, or if you're really ambitious, you can throw one at me. Um, so go ahead and continue on the conversation.
particularly, obviously, in our minds, scholars in since the second half of the 20th century. There's a huge amount of work being done, a huge amount of work. But it's been a very uneven in the kinds of effects it's had. And of course, that has everything to do with what's gone on politically and the ways in which the, the current discourses of race, contemporary discourses of race, are being played out. So you could say that you know, there was a moment 20 years ago when it looked as if things were getting better, as if people were getting along in a fairly cosmopolitan kind of way. And so what do we have now? We have a retreat into Little England and Little England ism and being Brexiteers and wanting to have borders and walls and fences and all the things that go with it and saying no to difference, saying no to difference. So there's a very uneven process that we have to deal with all the time and we have to be attentive to the changes that are taking place and what they mean. Well, the second major thing I want to say, which is, uh, uh, this is just my second point really, is that what we try to do is bring white slave owners is about saying, look here, all you people that live here, the plantations may have been over there, but the business was being run and race was happening here and there, and come on, it's about us. It's not about them somewhere else. So it's about bringing slavery home and saying to Britons, this is a white history, quite as much as it is a black history. Now, I know this is a black history event, but it seems to me that one of the most important things to say about black history is how it needs to be part of a bigger history that we all own. And of course, there is a good reason but the focus on black history because of the way in which it's been neglected. But white history has systematically excluded black history, and that has to change. That has to change. So the work on slave owners is to bring it home and to say all these people, three and a half thousand people in 1833, benefited hugely from the giving of compensation to slave owners because they were living here. And they weren't just people who were living in Bristol and Liverpool and Glasgow and London. They were living all over the country and they weren't all very rich slave owners. Some of them were very modest people with annuities that turned out to be based on the ownership of an enslaved person all kinds of reasons why people had property in people. They may never have been anywhere near the Caribbean, but they were living off enslaved people in the Caribbean. So we brought it home, but the slave owners have played a very significant part, I think, and I want to argue, in that whole process of defining what we mean by race and what race has gone on meaning for a very long time. In the period before, in the session we had before, some of this came up, and that idea of the making of race and the ways in which, what I would stress is that it has to be made and remade and remade and remade all the time because the kinds of boundaries that people are trying to create between one group of people and another are completely artificial boundaries. The attempt to fix those boundaries in place by talking about skin and bones and hair break down all the time, all the time, all the time. So the, the, the emphasis on making and fixing is because it cannot be fixed. And that's what we have to undo. We have to undo those artificial binaries which divide one set of people from another when we are all human beings with very, very different characteristics and bodies and skins. So I think the slave owners were, they were architects of a system 
which has had very, very long-term consequences. And they were always making Africans, as that thing up there said a little while ago, making Africans into Negroes and then into slaves, but they were also making white people themselves into freedom-loving Britons. So these were the two, these were meant to be the two fixed categories. You know, you are slaves and we are free people, free-born Englishmen. And that idea of that split between one kind of people and another, which has been played out in so many different ways and has had such long-lasting legacies, is one of the things is that we can see the very particular role that slave owners played in that process of making race. Let me stop there. Great, thanks, Catherine. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump right in, and I'll start with the end of my rant on Twitter. Last night, Heart Talk, BBC, uh, Marine Le Pen saying, French beaches are for the Brigitte Bardot's only. Lurking there is the question of race. It's not just religion, it's not just female body, although it is also about that, but it is about race. It is about that thing that the French don't like to name, but that she, she does name. And she's one of the few people who actually does. That's probably why she might be our next president. Hopefully not, but she might be. Um, a few scholars have looked into uh, the links between citizenship, even race in contemporary France, and the links with uh, the Republic's living past. And what they noted is that you can't really talk about the Declaration of the Right of Man and Citizens without, of 1793 without looking into other important texts like the Black Code, Black Code or Code Noir. There are two, there are two versions, the, 70, the 1685 and the 1724. And basically the codes were uh, to um, make sure that uh, uh, rebellions were minimal, but also to make sure that uh, mainland France had its supply of uh, colonial products. And in doing that, what they wanted to do is look into all sort of regulation. And they also regulated the relationship, well, not really relationship, encounters between masters and, and enslaved. And from that period onwards, end of um, slightly beginning of 18th century, the idea of race was not really mentioned, but the assumption was that people of uh, African descent were inferior. They were subjugated and therefore there was something wrong with them. They were there for labor, they were uh, inferior. And, but 18th century is also in France. So we have the dictionary of uh, Fourier, um, mainly done using the views of missionaries and it's very negative. I mean, today we would say it's racist. Uh, but at the same time, you have the Encyclopedia of D'Alembert et Diderot. And we might think that Enlightenment people were all, you know, hypocrites and all that. But there's actually a few things like an article written by uh, Louis de Joncourt, de Joncourt about the trade in Negroes, where he def defends the right of uh, those Negroes to be free. Okay? And that was uh, 1751. So we have that constant tension between the intellectuals uh, the politicians and the planters. And those, plant those politicians, those groups had strong links with uh, the West Indies and with uh, plantations uh, owners. And speaking of plantations, Josephine de Beauharnais, Napoleon's first wife, was the daughter of a plantation uh, owner. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of, a bit of background and I'm, I'll be really quick because it is important. 1789, beginning of the French Revolution, 10 years later, um, well, Napoleon was asked to come and help, but Napoleon being Napoleon, he decided to seize power and to install himself as the, the lead. So 79, 1799, he seized power, and what does he do? 1802, he decided to reestablish slavery that had been abolished by the revolutionary 10 years before. Uh, it has been argued in France, and Napoleon is a big, huge, um, much-loved figure in France. It has been argued that Napoleon was not a racist. Napoleon was looking only at economic 
uh, imperatives. Now, there is one quote here that I want to read. Um, he said, how could freedom be granted to Africans, to those men who had no civilization and no idea what a colony meant? In other words, they, those men, did not grasp the importance and the skills, he argued, needed to set up a colony. And how dare they? They actually had no respect for property. These are his views. One of the most revered men in the history of France. Um, now, he was writing in a very specific context, okay? He was writing the context of European context. You had the Swiss um, poet, Johann Levater, who made his contribution to history and to literature was that there was a, a strong link between beauty and intelligence. By essence, Europeans were beautiful, and therefore, they were intelligent. We also have um, Petrus Kampa, facial angle theory. For Petrus, um, Petrus Kampa, you probably know this, uh, the ideal of beauty uh, was uh, measured by facial angle and therefore, by essence again, Europeans were the most uh, beautiful people. So these were the context, that was the context. All these writings actually inspired a French diplomat and aristocrat known as Arthur de Gobineau, author of essay on the inequality of races, and that is uh, 1853. So 18th century, 19th century, and Gobineau is known in France as one of the fathers of so-called scientific racism. For some of you who might know, he later inspired Wagner and, oh, and Nazis. And he's also present in the literature provided by uh, the Front National, as you may know. Now, so there's therefore a link between citizenship and race. And one cannot understand France, really, by um, looking only at that without also looking at another important piece of legislation, the Indigenous Code of 1887. And that code disappeared only in 1944-47, and it was set up in Algeria. And it was later expanded to the rest of the uh, French colonies. What it said, is said, uh, among other things, that it classified people. You had the evolved and the indigenous. The evolved were people who, could, uh, who were assimilated, who could uh, follow French ways of life and, um, and um, support the language. And uh, in the French Caribbean, the, the thing was completely different. Those evolved were not necessarily French citizens. But in the French Caribbean, it was in 1848 that things changed. It meant that people in the Caribbean became French citizens. Before that, they were not. They were enslaved. They were not citizens. 1848, it's the, um, the abolition of the French, uh, uh, French slavery. And therefore, people were asked to forget about the past, which meant that to, be, to become French citizen, you have to renounce your past, your culture, your customs, everything. So uh, Miriam Cotias showed how actually this idea of renouncing the past your customs and the difference was, um, well, of course, uh, damaging for the national discourse, but uh, retrieving what has been forgotten was clearly important for historians, and because it actually helped uh, social cohesion. Oh, I'm going really, really fast. Um, nonetheless, remembering that past does not mean that France deals really well with race. In fact, race is a dirty word. We don't use race. Uh, Race doesn't appear in, many, in, many, uh, in the Constitution, uh, although people of African descent, including North Africa, are still suffering from uh, discrimination based on the color of their skin. And I'm arguing that memorialization, as wonderful as it is and as necessary as it was, shies away from the question of race. You can find um, monuments in France, quite a few, but you, 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 we even have the 10th of May, that is uh, an important date, um, with a celebration attended by the highest member of the, the state, the president, and yet the, the, there is a discrepancy between the nation's universalist project and the social reality of d based on discrimination, based on uh, skin color. So the debate is ongoing, but powerful organizations are working to... Um, to stop that. And uh, we have La CIMAD, La Baudet Coloniale, Le Grand, Le Comité pour la Mémoire de l'Esclavage, and many others 
who are working to try and fight discrimination, but it doesn't mean that they all address the question of race, because in, in our mind, race means differences. Differences means that classification, and classification means that you can put in place laws like affirmative action that actually classify, that still separate people and put them in different, in different groups. So um, the debate, as I said, about the Burkini is about also about race. The recent Paris attacks and the Nice attacks are also articulated not only about, uh, around religion, but also around race. And France wouldn't just, would, would not talk about that question because they still consider that race is not essential. In my opinion, it is. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have um, a whole body of ideas going on there around sort of enlightenment thinking, rights of man, limits to that, um, and so on. Um, making race, disavowing race, silencing race, ignoring race. Um, so let's, let's uh, open this to the floor and um, are there, there are questions about this relationship between slavery and race? Anyone? Yes. So there's somebody at the very front, Hannah. <laughs> oh, there are two Hannahs. Sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. Hi there. This is quite a practical question for Olivet. Um, thank you both so much. That was absolutely fascinating. But um, so I'm aware of the fact that in British legislation, once Commonwealth citizens became eligible for, well, sorry, once. Commonwealth sub subjects, let me get that right, became eligible for citizenship, I think, in the 1940s or 50s in Britain. It led to the introduction of um, new immigration legislation in order to manage this. And so my question to Olivet um, was whether or not the same thing had happened in France, where, no, that... No, no, uh, 1848, people, um, they, they call them uh, overseas, people from uh, Outre-mer, ultra from overseas territories became French. For the rest of them, uh, there was a, a mixed kind of regime for people in Africa where the evolved could reach, could have citizenship, but it was not automatic. Uh, incidentally, um, nowadays to become a French citizen, you still have, you still go through questions in interview and the questions are, do you still have ties with people in Africa? Do you eat the food? Do you dress like that? And do you have really, really close family connections, as in, do you see them once a year? Okay. And presumably, if you answer positively to those questions, you that's going to... No. You just have to say no. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hi. Um, so, I have a question regarding France, and they have... I know that in France, they don't allow in any census or any application or anything, they don't allow you to Ask, they don't allow an employer or anyone to ask about your race, but they have your name. And obviously, if you're from African descent, your name will more, most likely show you've got African descent. And so it's put in place to stop discrimination, but obviously it does like the opposite. Um, what, how do you propose like we combat this? Because obviously have, they don't believe in like having race down, mm -hmm. but what would be the alternative? Um, that's a very good question because um, most, pe most people I know still don't want race to be talked about. They still want to fight against discrimination. They refuse positive, um, affirmative kind of, positive discrimination or affirmative action, all, all form of it. Well, I, I'm in favor, but that's just me. Um, and therefore, they're fighting not about race, but about against race, but against discrimination, which is, as you said, incredibly hard to do if you don't know how many people have been discriminated based on the color of their skin. But there are ways to do that. You record the number of people who, for example, for um, racial, well, they don't call it racial profiling, but racial profiling, you, there's a case that c came up a couple of days ago where there were lists of the number of uh, a list with the number of times so and so had been stopped, and these people were undercover, 
That's the only way, and yet they would not talk about race, they'll talk about discrimination. So I don't really have the answer. I, I think the answer would be to talk about race, but, you know. Ryan, does Hannah, is a, sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was, I recently saw, um, witnessed an academic uh, historian um, being asked about Britain's inability to confront its colonial past. Uh, and the, the historian responded by saying, uh, I would just say this, uh, nations don't do anything, people do. Um, I find that response quite problematic for a number of reasons. Um, I think the, the, the first of which, or the main one of, of, of which, is that um, the racist, the figure of the racist, is often used as a bogeyman and as a kind of moral palliative so that um, governments or uh, nations can feel that they are not racist, racists are. Um, and it seems to me that a lot of uh, damage uh, is, is done, um, not necessarily by individuals, although individuals can of course be um, very harmful in themselves, but actually through kind of structural and um, political uh, developments and, and policies. So I wonder if you could uh, both perhaps say something about the relationship between um, nation, the nation as a sort of state, as a government, um, and the idea of an indigenous race in, in England and in France. Mm. Can I start? Can I start? Okay. Um, well, I suppose, you know, I started off by talking about um, the colonial, the foreign office seeing to the destruction of documents. I mean, that is a direct government intervention in wanting to whitewash a history. So at that point, I mean, we're clearly talking about the role of the government and the um, continued silence on that over a very, very, very long period until the discoveries about the Mau Mau torture and William Hague eventually having to um, admit responsibility. So that's at, at the national level, that's one of the things that can happen. Well, when we're talking, I mean, another level would be to think about history writing and the ways in which history writing has also, um, in many ways, over the 19th and early 20th centuries, done a very good job of whitewashing British history. So the whole position of what we might call Whig history, that, that view of history as being English history, as being the long story of progress. You know, everything is getting better um, from Magna Carta onwards. What we can see is the, de the, the development of democracy over time and you know, it's getting more and more progressive. And that story has uh, very much ignored empire. So obviously there have always been other historians who've been saying other things, but the orthodoxy has been so heavily in that direction until relatively recently. And so we could go on with the different levels and ways in which governments, individuals, professions, societies do or do not um, face these issues. And it's always contested. I mean, I suppose in a way, that's the most important thing to hold on to, that, you know, there's never, there's never, fortunately, only one history. There's always, I mean, history is about, it's about argumentation. It's about one position and another position and another position and another position, and it never, ever, ever being finished like race, we could say, that, you know, there's never a simple truth about any of this. So you can go on arguing forever and ever and ever. And that's what historians do. But some stories get more purchased than others. Some get incorporated into uh, history teaching, as we heard earlier, while others don't. So the contestation takes place always at many different levels of the territory, as to how effectively you can intervene in the education of the nation, for example. 
So that's some responses mm. to a big question. Oliver, yeah. Did you want? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think that, there's, that, that there, isn't just, there isn't just one level. In France, there seems to be that huge gap between government and the population, but the government actually relies on the work of experts. And I'll bring now my, one of my uh, things, <laughs> is about the question of representation. Uh, in France, there are many people of African descent who are, among other things, history professors, when they write those reports, those reports have to take into account their, uh, their stories as well. Therefore, the elections, presidential elections are next year. President Francois Hollande had to take into account the new report on the discrepancy between um, the level of uh, income in, in the um, Outre-mer, in overseas territory, uh, compared to the one in mainland France. So there's constant battle between the two, and I'm quite positive that, you know, by using, by, by using wisely that question of representation, things can turn around. In, 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 in the case of France, it's going to take a, a bit more, a bit longer than how many before, so, countries. Yeah. Before we turn this over, I just wanted to, uh, sort of chair's privilege, um, also mentioned the, the, the role of law in this. Um, all these <laughs> European powers that had plantation economies in the Caribbean or in mainland North America, you know, slavery was enshrined in slave codes and those slave codes were instrumental in, if you like, this process of othering and defining what a black person could or could not do or in some case, cases indigenous um, peoples in, in, the, in mainland North America, and those, those had an incredible impact. Um, we haven't talked about the United States, but if you think of the relationship between those slave codes and segregationist laws in the 1890s right through to the civil rights movement of the 1950s, law has been one of the ways in which the, in a way answering your question, Ryan, the way in which the nation has actually enshrined race as, as a, a very, very important driving factor in the way in which societies in, in the Western world work, I think. Um, anyway. Can I just add yeah. to that? Yeah. Because, I mean, the laws, colonial laws, not only enshrined um, the exclusion of en the enslaved from giving evidence in courts, for example, which was one of the most important ways of silencing people, mm. uh, but it also enshrined white privilege so law has never been, the laws have never been only about what, you, what white people do to the enslaved. They've been about what white people can enjoy themselves. Yes. And I was just reading a wonderful article on the way up here, actually. Um, I mean, it's incredibly arcane, but it's, a, a, it's about a, a debate that goes on in Jamaica in 1748, when there was an attempt by the governor and some large scale slave owners to slightly improve the situation of the possibilities of enslaved people giving evidence. And it was blocked by popular action uh, and petitioning by, quote, small whites. So not big slave owners at all, but the people who only owned a small number of enslaved people who were very anxious about defending the lines of white privilege and ensuring that because of the whiteness of their skin, they belonged in one party and everybody else mm. belonged in another. So these mm. arguments, arguments about the law, are one of mm. the places in which race is made over and over yeah. again. Yeah. And, and one of those privileges is the ability to read and write. And as students here, if you think about, one of the things that slave codes made explicit was those enslaved could not read or write. They must not be taught to read or write. So if you think of those as fundamental privileges which are about empowerment, you can see how these slave codes and, and the way in which law works in these societies, it seems to me. So, and I don't think we pay enough attention to way, in way which law in different guises and in different nations has actually had this impact on the way in which we think about about race. And these are the laws which have their origins in slavery. So this is the, the common denominator. Sorry, that's enough from me. Um, shall we now go to the casinos with our <laughs> chips? <laughs> Uh, 
Um, Kate. So the middle table. For our freedom, we have a duty to fight for our freedom. We 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 have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our. We have a duty to win. Love and duty to fight for our freedom. To win, we must love one another. We must but our chains. Also, activists, um, community in of this narrative that many people have wonderfully uh, illuminated today. Um, this, this single story about Britain, sort of like being, you know, a minor player with enslavement, Wilberforce coming and freeing everybody, and everyone living happily ever after. The narrative is a little bit naughty. When you're a community <laughs> educator. One of the things you can do is that you're not constrained by uh, certain uh, rich language practices. So we can actually, you know, kind of like challenge the use of language, challenge the use of terminology. So, uh, you know, we were having some fantastic discussions around our table and the idea about enslavers came around. And I say enslaver, I say, if I said to you, um, what does a builder do? You know, or who, you know, what, what do you call a person who builds? People recognize as a builder. If I said, what, what do you call a person who's involved in politics? What would, what would be the answer to that? Politician, generally, okay. If I said to you, what do you call a person who enslaves other people? We have this kind of like confusion. It's quite simple. They're an enslaver. But we have these new terms, these fancy terms like uh, plantation owners, you know, <laughs> these kind of like lovely kind of like pictures and galleries of these lovely plantation owners sitting and drinking coffee or whatever was popular at the time. So being a community educator means that we can challenge those kind of things. It also means that we could bring an embodied experience into teaching about Ma'afa or African history. And what I mean by that is one of the things, again, that comes through with terminology is that you'll often hear the term, I think Tony Blair coined it in 2007, and it's, it keeps going around, that slavery was legal at the time. Now, I think Robin made a very good point about this, as, uh, you know, and, and so many others decided Catherine about there being all these contested histories. Slavery was legal at the time. Well, if you were sitting here and a a group of armed men came in here, and whether they negotiated or they just terrorized the people who were security and took you, you would not see that process as legal. And so those Africans who were on the motherland who were enslaved did not regard that legal. The parents of those people, the grandparents, did not see that process as legal. So at no time in history was that legal. So the so-called, and I can't use the term trade, was not a legal enterprise. It was a crime. And so it means that when I teach in a community setting, we can explore these ideological positions in a, without any feeling of fear. Mm -hmm. It means we can open up other avenues to explore about what does justice look like. Justice doesn't mean reparation as in compensation of money. You know, justice means self-determination. Thank you. Um, you've actually partially answered my kind of second question, but because you both work and you set up independent community organisations and you work independently and in partnership with the institutions. Um, I wonder, Lisa, if you could expand on the positives of that, that you're working outside the museum context and those kind of restrictions, because Toyin has talked about it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there's so, there so many positives yeah. that you couldn't, just couldn't cover them all, but I think one of the real positive things about our project was we were able to create black space together. So it's very difficult to do that in, in um, certain contexts, but because we were out in the community, with community, leading on the project, we were able to create black space wherever we went, whether that was on the bus, going towards an att attraction, or actually at the attraction, or in the grounds of the attraction. We created a space that we could own, um, that we could, um, infuse our feelings into to that space to create we could create the mood yeah. uh, of that space we could use like you say our language in that space and so that was really really powerful um, and I think that really um, contributed to the the, the healing uh, nature of the journey which was sort of an, an unintended outcome really of the whole project I must say um, that we were able to use spaces to discuss um, issues affecting the, the black community, issues affecting our young people, um, 
you know, how we can heal divisions, how we can um, do healing work with each other, uh, etc. The reasons for some of our, our behaviours. So I think, for me, that was the, you know, they, they, they were some of the really big positives about the project. Stop that's great. There, no, 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 that's great. Th thanks <laughs> for that answer, because it did come up earlier. Somebody did talk about, you know, the trauma, post-traumatic kind of effects of that, so that is a very positive thing. Can I just say, what yeah. I do want to say as well, um, our project was called the Slave Trade Legacies Project, yeah. And I think what you get when you do these projects with a community led by a community is you get um, legacy. You get legacies mm -hmm. that are legacies which the community wants. Yeah. So um, out of that project, or partly out of that project, you know, we've now got the Black History Society, which is about to um, launch uh, in November. And also, actually, a good number of the the volunteers on the Slave Trade Legacies project are now actually involved in Black Lives Matter. Uh, in Nottingham as well, so you know, it politicises people, it, it motivates people, you know, when you do projects like this in the community. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and my next question is, I guess it's about acknowledging the work that you both do, which is how do you feel about the lack of funding and recognition for this on the ground work, because, you know, a lot of money and funding will go into kind of academia and uh, we talked about bigger institutions getting that funding but i'm just interested in your perspective on how that isn't about the way funding is worked and the, also the recognition as well just start with you toy the funding question is quite interesting because in so many ways it forces you to be innovative it forces you to i mean how do you feel about it well you, you do feel aggrieved because yeah. i mean despite anything we're still taxpayers um, we still have a right for a service that caters for our needs as well. Yeah. It should cater for everyone. So there's, there's, there's a moral issue that you're angry about. But on the other side, it's like if the situation has persisted for so long, there has to be a change. You have yeah. to recognise, well, you have to be innovative to find a way around it. Um, recognition, again, is another uh, frustration because, I mean, I, I, I think of, um, you know, uh, there are so-called historians, I won't name them, who go on television <laughs> saying that the whites have turned black after uh, uprisings. <laughs> People condemn them, um, mm -hmm. saying that, well, what you said was vaguely racist. Mm -hmm. And then two weeks later, they're on question time. David Stark. And, <laughs> 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 and no, but, but so essentially what's happening is that these views are, are still, even though they've been said to be condemned, it, you know, they are being accepted. And so it means that our work is, is even harder. It means that what happens is that with that, that lack of recognition, it means that we can't fight the indoctrination that many people have. I mean, and, and this is the thing, because one of the things I, I, I really enjoyed about today was this dimension of do we teach primary school children or just secondary school children? Yeah. And as someone who's, you know, had, who has children, um, I've had to engage in home education. So at primary stage, my children are in, in engaged in part-time home education so I can create a space to teach them this history which is safe, which is uncontested, so that they can actually, we can go to museums, we can go to galleries. Very problematic with the authorities, but my children grow up very culturally rich. Yeah. So by the time they reach secondary school, they actually are, you know, they're pre-armed. Mm -hmm. Um, lack of funding, lack of recognition means that you have to find different ways to deal with these, with these, issue, these issues. Right. Okay, and uh, Lisa, do you want to pick up on that point about the lack of, uh, you know, the funding issue and the lack of recognition for the important work that, you know, you both do on the ground? Um, one of the things that was, it was quite amusing but really frustrating um, on the project is the amount of times we came across um, the answer to funding was that, oh, we did that in 2007. Um, oh, that, that, it, so it's done now, jobs of a thing. You know, even from English Heritage, we had wow. this, well, oh, well, we did, a bit, you know, in 2007, almost like no reason now to do anything to do, you know, around. It's over uh, now. It's, yeah, yeah it, it's done. So that was really frustrating. Okay. Um, you know, reparations at the end of the day. You know, this is what reparations should look like. If we are going to talk reparations, we should be looking at this country actually investing in, in projects, um, not just like the one that we did, but, you know, other projects which actually enable people to um, explore this and other histories in safe black spaces or any spaces um, in ways which are healing. Um, so, yeah, you know, reparations just comes to mind. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, we had like 9,700 bomb um, heritage lottery fund, 
loads of volunteers, and that's where you know most of our resources came from, from the volunteers themselves, their time, their efforts. And you know, we were um, we made it to the final of the national uh, lottery award. She's fantastic. Uh, Round of know, applause. Uh, uh, so the project did, not us as individuals, the project made it, you know, up against the one that won it was a £5.2 million project, you know, so you can create, um, if, if the passion, if you've got, you know, if you've got the passion, the love um, for, for your people, um, and you, you, you design projects which have so many benefits, then it's amazing how much you can get done on a relatively small budget. But that's not to justify small budgets. I mean, we want more <laughs> money. Yeah. Don't do, do yourself short. Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, and uh, my kind of final question, really, which is quite, I think is quite an important one, is what do you feel that academia and other institutions and museums can learn from, you know, this way of working? Um, I'd just be interested in your thoughts because I'm interested in flipping the situation around where I kind of feel that those institutions can learn so much from the work that you both do. Um, well, t today there was so much fantastic yeah. feedback coming back. I mean, I, I kind of had to adjust my list because <laughs> it's like there is some good work being done that perhaps isn't being reported on and that's part of the challenge. But I did come up with a few things that I thought that were quite straight. Um, I, I've methods, uh, and when I say methods, um, the history, and this particular history, is, is rich and one of the key uh, um, driving forces is orality. There's an understanding that African orality is just as valid a source of data um, as a textbook, which we didn't have access to writing in the first place. So one of the things as a community educator, you'll find that you might find an elder who's kind of like just touching under 100, and they have a very strong, vivid memory. Um, plus documentation, that might be inside a card or, or, or a song that's been culturally transmitted through generation to generation that actually depicts and actually helps score what was going on at that time. And that's something that sometimes you can only access through trust. There has to be a face that the person trusts so you can sit down, have the patience and the skills. And sometimes academia uh, uses its status to acquire knowledge, not understanding that that very status pushes away people yeah. from it. So that's one thing. I'll be very quick on the others. Uh, shortly, uh, African history is not the story of, of anti-racism. Yeah. I can't stress that enough because many times when people are talking about uh, African history in general, uh, it's a story of what was bad uh, and what we did about it. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it really needs to, to move away from that. Perhaps this is not the crowd that I need to be telling that message to, but academia as a whole needs to learn that. Uh, anthropological enrichment. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that again, using the orality as a good example, that it's the stories, the individual stories that you, that you get by going out to people yeah. from family that enrich it. It's not always just the, the, the cold, stark data. The detail really is in those cracks. And finally, um, that world history is not black and white. Yeah. Um, that's really been underpinned by what a lot of people said, but it's not been crystallised quite. It's not just black and white, and British history isn't just white. Uh, someone mentioned the Shoah or the Holocaust, a uh, Jewish uh, Shoah for it. I talked about the Ma'afa. Um, and, you know, people recognise the impact that has, how it's in, why it's in the curriculum, what it means. But what people don't understand is that the outcome of, of, of much of that. Yeah. Um, was the 1945 United Nations uh, and then in leading all the way to kind of like this, this thing that the Brexit has just left, this, this safety net. Part of that, not United Nations, uh, EU, but part of this EU as well was also the institutionalization of European Convention of Human Rights. Now, human rights is instrumental to the idea that the I slavery is abhorrent, it's, it's illegal. Um, if people are now accepting that we're in a climate where it's okay to disparage human rights and we, we have a government that's saying that we're going to uh, repeal the Human Rights Act and replace it with a British Bill of Rights, we're in a very dangerous time, but everything seems okay because EastEnders is still on. Well, everything isn't okay. We're in a climate where people have voted against their own economic interests and they're now talking about repelling human rights or repealing human rights. That's the kind of climate that leads to the attacking of Polish men who are talking their own mother tongues by gangs of teenagers who have been miseducated about what it means to be a human being. So those are, sorry to, to long it out, but no. those are some of the things that academia... 
it must take the time and have the humility to reach and reach down to the people where they are. And I, I don't mean down in a condescending, but I mean down, reach them where they are and talk to them on that level. Can all behind some of this sex. We know how to we know we know how to give you it like this and you um just stick with it if, if you're academics and you're going, you know doing this stuff around there's a lot of drive around impact on community now isn't there how your research for example impacts uh, the community that's where you're getting your, your your brownie points these days so if you want to go out and work with um communities um you've got to work at a relationship with with them and you've got to let go of some of the power to be quite frank you've got to be easy with just like let letting go of the power leave those chains behind you're not going to you know you've got to you've got to have trust that you know people in the community can actually lead on this stuff and do a really good job on this stuff um yeah so that's it really we okay. got this <laughs> okay thanks very much um what i'm going to do now because we're kind of all right for time which is a miracle um, <laughs> We've got time to take maybe one or two questions for the panel. So does anybody have a question for Toyin or Lisa? Put your hand up. Yep, there's one here. Hi, I've got a question for Lisa. And it was actually, the project that you were doing sounded really fascinating. And I'm wondering, did you find that any actually <laughs> um, <laughs> Did any of on positive the idea being raised? Did anyone like stop and think and go, yeah, that's something we need to do? So, great question. Planted earlier. <laughs> it wasn't. Their history links. They're diverse. Liverpool. Bless him. You know. So, um, another volunteer asked at Newstead Abbey. Um, so, um, where did you know? So asked a question about um, about Wildman. Colonel Wildman, who's um, basically owned plantations. And uh, why, don't, why don't you talk about that era? Why don't you talk about, you know, because this is where the material wealth of this um, attraction has come from. And the answer was, well, he, did, he never went to the Caribbean. Uh, uh, you know, this level of sort of, um, it was ignorance, but innocent ignorance, which, you know, these guides just didn't have the story, they didn't have the narrative, they didn't have the knowledge to be able to impart this um, information. But, you know, as a testament really to the project and to the project volunteers, the World Heritage Site at the time was planning, I think it was a 19 million pound exhibition, which will, is gonna be there for years. And now the whole face of that exhibition has been changed to include, um, you know, the histories of enslaved people. But also interestingly, and this is how kind we are as, as you know, Caribbean community, is what the volunteers brought up is that, you know, the working class white people are not acknowledged in your histories either. You know, and now, you know, th there is, you know, that um, visual um, representation really of, of our contribution, which is great. And we've been up and shown our films. There was one of our films was shown earlier. We've made a couple. Uh, you're here tomorrow, if, it, if you're coming back tomorrow for some more of this. Um, then, you know, so that basically, and that will be an enriching experience for all visitors. You know, this, this is not to enrich the visitor experience for the black community. It will actually be enriching for all visitors um, to those attractions. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> I've got time for one more. Is there any question for Toyin at all? No questions. Well. Oh, there is. Just right at the back. Right at the back there. Hi. Can you see? I've got my glasses. Uh, <laughs> I can see a face. It's a rubber. Might not work Thank you for you for you toying. This is the. Uh, um, we've got a great a great deal of admiration for you for what you undertook during the uh, whole period of the Wilberfest activities <laughs> in two thousand and seven, <laughs> and the amazing. Uh, show of resilience and persistence in talking to Her Majesty the Queen and Tony Blair and requesting an apology from them which was incredibly censored and the whole journey thereafter if anybody hasn't seen it should really look at your videos and and take the opportunity to 
uh, embrace something which many of us would have loved to have been brave enough to actually have done or had the opportunity of done. So I, I, I definitely congratulate you for that. Yeah. Um, also as a home educator, for very similar reasons uh, to yourself, um, the scenario which we're faced with now is our children being in mainstream secondary education and trying to find ways in which we can eke elements of African-centric education, non-slavery-based education in many ways, uh, into that curriculum. Are there any... What would you implore? And, 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 one of, and, and I suppose the point which I... One of the difficulties I've found, I should say, is that many of the teachers feel an empathy for that request, but don't feel particularly empowered in terms of materials and don't feel particularly empowered politically to challenge the uh, environments which they're in to actually change that. What have you found in, in, in your inquiries and are there any signs of success or a change in curricula in the way in which an African-centric approach is being discussed in secondary education? Wow. Um, thank you, first of all. Just a little question. <laughs> thank you for the kind comments. That's, that's my evil twin brother. I just look exactly like him um, who did that. But no, um, I, I, no there's, there's a <coughs> I made a documentary called The Walk, which you can catch on YouTube if you want to know what he's talking about. I, I, don't, I don't talk much, but I thank you for that. Um, on the education side, I found many things, actually, because um, I've got three children, two boys, uh, one girl. And um, the home education process was very challenging. I part home educated because I wanted my children to be like a, a whole world history uh, view and also to be independent even from a very young age as learners. But at the same time, I don't have a, a, a lab, a laboratory inside my home. So things like science and certain topics, I wanted them to have access to the resources that I pay through through my tax. So that's why I part home educated. But when I went to secondary school, thankfully they already had this, I would call it like an inoculation, like a, an ideological inoculation. Um, but I still, I've always been a governor at every single school my children have gone to. <coughs> and I was just talking with someone earlier. Um, yeah, I really am hands-on dad. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, my, the last school that my children went to, an academy, and I won't name it, um, and I, I've had many battles trying to get them to include uh, African-centric and, and just a wider narrative than kind of like just a prescribed go head of um, the British Museum, telling a history and all the, the, the contentious parts of it. So w what I do is that I learnt as a, as a tactic, A, um, when inside schools, be a governor, but don't be a governor on the curriculum uh, committee, which was my mistake. You, everyone thinks, well, I'm going to go on the curriculum, I'm going to change the curriculum, and I'm going to make sure they put the right things on it. It doesn't work. You get tied up in knots. What you need to do is be a governor on the finance committee. Because when you're on the finance committee, voted down by the night, I, I, I you know what I mean? To, to know that you're fighting for something right. And then it's a democratic process, which I didn't believe in, and kept on getting voted down. But when I was on the finance committee, then all of a sudden everyone's your best friend. <laughs> and then you could start making changes, you know. I remember him coming up to me, Toyin, you know a Carla, like, can you get him to come into... And I'm like, you yeah, you know, it doesn't work like that. Oh, I almost said his name. It doesn't work like that. You know, you kind of have to make changes, structural changes and things. So that's the, on that aspect. On a cultural education basis, though, I think one of the things that we make a mistake of, I mean, I'm a nerd. I love sci-fi. I've, I've got my reader, I've got my books. I'm always, you know, I mean, games, the whole lot. And I think that sometimes we forget that when it comes to young people learning, and it's where it's got to start off with young people, is that the world has changed. And sometimes we don't, adapt the history to the new art forms that are out there. So I'm talking about graphic novels, I'm talking about video games, I'm talking about apps, I'm talking about every form of media that's out there. Because I'm pretty sure that you could find a tale of Romeo and Juliet on every media platform because the state has an interest in pushing the bard as its <laughs> number one story. I'm saying that if you are serious about this history, Slavery, because we're talking about slavery today, but also colonialism and, and also the African histories and beyond that, we need to find more sophisticated ways to teach it because young people get traumatized by that history. My children have their frenosive uh, history short to my life. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, th thanks. That was a great way to end our sort of panel discussion because I'm just aware of the time. Oh, so it's fine. It was quite free to think about we were up here and then. Yeah.
So that was a good call. Lisa doing that. I was thinking, Lisa's going to come up with someone. I know. I know. <laughs> She'll pull someone out of the back. He's woken everybody up. Yeah. I feel awake now. Yeah. Yeah. I feel much better. I like that we are talking to each other. It's just yeah. human and yeah. sitting behind there. Yeah. Like, and he's brilliant. Isn't he? He's great. It Isn't all it? makes sense. We should be in there. I wish he was in there too. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can uh, go down and see him or something. Because he's only in Hackney. He's in Hackney. Works. He's based in London, in Hackney. So. Mm -hmm. But just the fact he's an activist, community activist and educator, it's a yeah. similar yeah. combination. Yeah. So I have to thank uh, Katie, she's a genius. So. Okay. Okay. Oh, is this on? Okay, what we're going to do is... We've got about five minutes, so... It's okay. What I'd like to do is just ask if anybody's got any comments um, in the last five minutes, Just we'll just go around. So if anybody's got a comment or a question for Toyn and Lisa, put your hand up now, because we've got a couple of minutes. Hello, Toyin. Yeah, so uh, the question about um, your children, um, what, what you were saying, if you can continue about um, what what age do you expose them to? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I feel like skipping with this. Um, no, um, I know there's an age certification system uh, in the UK, and uh, it's quite funny because when I, as an activist, I remember when I was uh, challenging um, one of these, these, I think it was Elspell, I can't remember what they're called, but they certified video games and they had the N-word in them. So I said that they should have ratings on them. And they do now, but at the time they just argued flat out no. And I, you know what I mean? But what I believe is that each child has a different level of maturity and you as a parent have to know that. You have to be sensitive towards that because the history can be traumatising. It can be empowering and uplifting and it can make sense of the youth. But children of three different ages, I've had to be sensitive towards what I can expose them to and what I don't. So I tend to, me and my wife are always present with them so that they can ask questions. I mean, Channel 4 is doing a series right now on young people and depression. And it's in the news, and so we decide, okay, our children are going to watch this, it's the news, and oh God, not Channel 4 News again, Dad. But they sit down, <laughs> and then we discuss the issues. And, and, so, and so you kind of know your children, you've got to have a, a level that you can move it through with them, and they feel comfortable. We also have a circle time, so on Sundays, we tend to focus specifically on African history, resistance, so we'll find a film, there's uh, Akala and the Bee, there's, the, I mean, there's so many good films that you could find that we are very strict about our Sundays for. And, and that, I mean, hopefully that answers your question. There's no strict rules. Each family has to find their own way of doing it. But I would always say that when it comes to children, especially with the access to the media right now and how, I mean, I come from a generation where we say children don't have televisions in their bedroom. And I thought I was going to stick to that. And I, my children don't have televisions in their bedroom. But then I realized they have a phone, they have a tablet, which means they can access iPlayer and 4OD. And so what was happening, I'd see a blue light underneath their bedroom and I'd realize, oh my gosh, I'm going to start locking off the internet at certain times. So you have to understand your children when dealing with this history. It's very key. Okay, is there any other comments or questions? One back there. Hello. Um, yeah, this is a question to both of you, but um, it's a follow-up from the conversation I was having with Toy and outside. And um, the question I asked earlier about um, how do we raise our kids through the trauma, mm -hmm. that we're looking for um, suggestions in helping to build a community, but then we live in a modern day society where we're forced to be out there on our own and kind of work to provide for ourselves and look after ourselves. And an African proverb is it takes a village to raise a child. And so we've lost that community. We're all on our own in this world. Like how do we re fully repair ourselves if we're on our own? I think your questions are bang on today, I have to say. Um, you know, it, it, it's a big question and the answer has to be big. Um, I haven't got any overnight answers to that. Um, certainly in terms of our work with Black Lives Matter, we're really looking at, people think of the activism, they think of the actions, you know, the shutdowns and all the rest of it, that's part of it, the campaigning stuff. That could actually be quite um, 
healing in itself to do actually you know to feel that you can actually you have a voice and that you know you can project that voice and amplify that voice or amplify the voices of those le least heard in our in our communities um, which are voices of young people um, voices of people with mental health issues voices of immigrants you know I could go on and on um, but you know it's a big question in Black Lives Matter at the moment is is how do we do this healing work so you know the activism is not just about going off and <laughs> you know, making uh, national news, disruptive acti activities. It is really, there's that other healing, healing divisions, um, healing ourselves, working on ourselves, um, looking inwards, um, and um, self-care, these notions of self-care, which is, you know, uh, as a black community, we really, really need, you know, yes, whatever happens, you know, in whenever it happened, the what was the bicentenary, the ending of, of the slave trade and all the rest of it. Do you know something? We're not free yet. Black people are not free. You know, and we're still fighting for our freedom. Mental freedom, you know, we, we, a lot of us are in mental slavery. There's so much work to do. And there's a lot of segregation in our own community as well. There's a lot of divisions, which, which is, which is the, the legacy of slavery. Or, you know, one of the big legacies of slavery is this divide and rule. Uh, it's a massive question and... and to draw on Spongebob. Yeah. <laughs> Spongebob. Spongebob's very optimistic and my son kind of like indoctrinated Spongebob in my head. So you always, you know, kind of look on the bright side of life. We're not alone. It, it, it looks like we're alone, but we're not alone. And what happens is that what happens is that we're isolated. And so we have to know that we're not alone so we can seek out like-minded friends and people, people who can work with us, who can help us. If privilege is inherited, then so is the opposite. So is disadvantage, and that's what happens. So you know instantly, if there are people who are privileged above causing trouble down there, then there are others who actually share the same situation as you. And so those parents need to be empowered before they can empower their children as well. They've got to do the same work concurrently. But it's losing the notion that there is no community, just understanding that it's hard to find each other through the fog, because the fog is artificial. It's there. The whole immigration nonsense and Brexit nonsense, targeting each other, kind of looking at different things to divide us. That's all fog. We are here. And once we unite and we help each other, that's when things start to change. But we must break the myths that it's hopeless, because that's the, probably the worst thing that was given to those that were enslaved, that you can never be free, you'd never win. And those who fought for our freedom, that mean I can stand here today, they never believed that. They knew that there was this idea, this concept, called freedom and something called home. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we're going to end there because I don't want to overrun. And uh, I just want to say thanks to Toy and Elisa. Uh, my name is Bo. It's been great chairing this panel discussion. And um, thanks to Katie. You're a genius putting us three together. That's it. Thank you. in London at a planning of uh, Aboriginal and Pacific Island wow. reparations oh, wow. contingent. So they've been here all week and unfortunately I we agreed to that before I knew about this. Right, right, yeah. So yeah, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna there. Number twelve <laughs> all right, I'm gonna be in two places at one time. I think we're just gonna uh, jump into it. Sure. That's fine. I'm set and that's my husband's just got back from Papua New Guinea actually. Oh, okay. yeah, the way he's looking kind of um, deep sea mining, uh, working yes. with activists there yes. and uh, yeah, oh, that is going kind on. of environmental <laughs> Okay, okay. Yeah. sure. Okay. <coughs> Good afternoon, and welcome to the last of our afternoon panels uh, dealing with the issue of slavery and reparations. My name is Jean Alain, and I'll 
uh, chairing this session. Uh, I'm going to turn uh, to each of, my, of the presenters today uh, to introduce themselves, and then we'll just jump into questions and really follow the same format as we have previously. So, uh, Esther, if you'd introduce yourself. Greetings, I'm Esther Stamford Cosse, and I'm a reparationist, which basically means a reparations activist. Okay, can you hear me now, or? Yeah. Esther Stamford Cosse, I'm a reparationist, reparations activist, most known for my activism in PARCO, the Pan-African Reparations Coalition in Europe. I'm also doing a PhD in history, in the history of the international South African reparations here in the UK, and I'm doing that at Chichester. And I'm very much involved with many grassroots African uh, community-led initiatives around reparations, and have co-founded and been in and internationally. And uh, hi, thank you. Uh, to my name's Nikki. Uh, I'm about mapping memories. A little bit about that as well. It's right away. And the, and the first is, let's see, which is as a phase modern day movement in its various forms, genocide, racism, and their shared legacy. So the manga Mizi is the term that we use, but concrete and in Mizi campaign, which was initiated about three years ago. Uh, we talk about these known as Afri Dij. Um, um, we lack a sort of geopolitical identity in common, and so we tend to take on the identities of those colonising coming to the language here in Britain, the African uh, movement for reparations, then we see that this thinking was always there, particularly in the legacy of the Africa reparations movement that got founded in 1993 and, and sort of finished around 1999-2000. And some of us who came after that have just continued on that legacy, really, movement. A comment on uh, production of the movement wherever we are. So it's a global citizenship. So it we all physically have to leave as Polish people have. It hasn't been discussed. Um, one of the key differences in some ways between the UK uh, and France in terms of these. Um, the, uh, the law itself between um, France and the UK to recognise the sovereignty of uh, the Guadeloupian people, in other words, to work towards independence. Another group based in uh, Martinique have submitted a legal case uh, against the French state calling for reparations, but that's kind of embroiled now in, in the bureaucracy of uh, the French legal system. And then probably the most well-known is a, a group called Le Cran, or the Representative Council of Black Associations, which particularly since Hollande's election has been lobbying uh, the president to even just talk about reparations, to have a public debate, in other words, to bring in different community sectors. So we have politicians, uh, you know, human rights activists, activists talking about, uh, talking about this subject, but he refused um, that political debate as well. So the next step was to actually um, submit a legal case against uh, the bank that administered the debt that Haiti paid, uh, uh, you know, extreme import uh, at the moment, as Haiti goes through yet another, uh, in inverted commas, natural um, disaster. Uh, the, the bank that administered the 90 million gold francs, some 21 billion, uh, 21 billion uh, dollars in, in today's terms. Um, so all three groups use this uh, the Talbira law as kind of the cornerstone for their reparation demands, and that's because in France there is this additional legislation that says that uh, any crime against humanity is imprescriptible. In other words, it's not erased by time. We can, you know, you can uh, address it at any moment in history. Um, other key differences are the fact that within uh, their states, uh, but within a Caribbean context of sovereign states that are, are, are collectively trying to uh, mobilize to ask European governments to engage with reparations. Um, and we also have the big issue uh, for the overseas departments in Martinique, Guadeloupe, La Réunion, French Guiana, uh, in the fact that many of the reparation uh, movements are linked to independence. So that's kind of an additional hurdle. Um, for them. So, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Esther, uh, over the last year, uh, there's been a 
at least two conferences with regards to reparations and enslavement. Mm -hmm. um, what do you make of this growing interest of, of academics in, <clears throat> in your area? Um, it, it's a mixed bag for me, actually. Um, as somebody who is firmly in the community but also has a foot kind of half in, in academia now, um, doing the PhD that I'm doing, um, I feel that this interest on the one hand is showing that the movement is gaining more recognition and cannot be denied. And this is a key issue for some of us who are part of the movement, that there is a lot of what we call um, movement denial. Not only is there Ma'angamizi denial, there's also movement denial. And when you deny a movement, then it, it makes it look as though there are, there are, you know, we don't have any ideas, we're just kind of waiting for academic conferences to happen. Whereas the day-to-day -day work of movement builders and, and you know, organizers like myself is hard work. You know, it's unfunded work, it's work that is thankless in that sense, it's hard, hard work. And that's really what keeps these issues on the agenda. And so it is a, um, always a double-edged sword because some of the work that we have been doing has been around trying to create space in what we call establishment academia to not only develop uh, co-produced knowledge on reparations, but also to create that space for critical discussion and debate around these issues and to hopefully enrich and enlarge and public discourse around what reparations are about, what is the history of the movements, what are reparations activists seeking, so that people know it's much more than just money, because obviously there's this corporate media movement is about at all. So, and the others who organize healing for space, although some of them are around the bell to engage in them, and then uh, with Jean uh, at the University of uh, you know, Belfast, we're not sure what the legacy of that conference is as yet, but there is always an, an issue, I think, for us in the movement in that it relies on finding champions within these establishment organisations and institutions. And a lot of the time, these are personal champions in that people take a personal interest to get stuff done or to apply for research funds or whatever it may be. And what happens if those people leave or they get a new job or what have you, or the funding dries up, it means that perhaps they're no longer going to do that work. So there is an issue about sustainability. And uh, again, speaking from the movement perspective, what I was asked to also point out is that it feels as though the onus is always on us to make these engagements and to sustain these engagements. And actually, the movement feels as though it doesn't benefit very much from this increasing academic, establishment academic um, awareness or space or discourse around reparations. of movement organizations are not being built. There is still a movement denial. There is still Mangamizi denial. And it feels like a constant uphill struggle when most of us literally live, like I personally live like a modern day abolitionist in that there's no resourcing for any of the work that I do. I work 100% for free and, and many of the people I work with are the same. So that is always the challenge and we don't get into that funding game because this is about our liberation and we don't want to fit our liberation into funding applications. Uh, but we recognise that there are people who may be able to get funding and that we can work together and hopefully try and shape these agendas that are more conducive to the movement. But that is always going to be an issue. What, how does the movement benefit from all this engagement? And in fact, the movement is benefiting very little in terms of increased visibility, increased capacity building, or increased internal networking amongst many of the different African and Caribbean diaspora movements around reparations that exist. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we had a number of other questions, but I think it's best if we leave it there from this part of it and, and open the floor up to questions. Uh, so we'll do that for about 10 minutes and then we'll, we'll break off into the tables. So if there are questions from the floor, we're open for business. So if you could just identify yourself. Oh, I'm Paula Sherrod. I work in marketing and I live in Nottingham. And um, I, I, the whole idea of reparations is, is so interesting. 
And before the war of against terror started in 2000, I really did feel as if this movement was gaining a lot of momentum. How has the sort of media blackout on what you're doing and, and the progress of it affected what you're doing and how can you counter that and how can people help with that? Okay. Um, thanks for that question. Great question. Uh, yes, the, there's been the, the, the corporate media is a big part of the problem because they tend not to be interested unless it's tied to another story that's about some big British institution that may have got funding to look at something to do with slavery. So it's never really about our story and what we are seeking or interviewing activists as who are living with the legacies today to sort of say, well, why is this issue important for you? Uh, around 2001, it was the, the third World Conference Against Racism, and then there was September the 11th, the war on terror, quote unquote, started, and that had a huge impact on the organizing and our ability and capacity internally within the movement, not only in Britain, so across in the so-called Americas, so in Africa, um, you know, social media, alternative media, as it were, but we lack the, um, the real global infrastructure to continually put out these messages in a consistent way that is shaping the public discourse. So around 2001 up until, say, about 2004, for instance, there was a huge um, grassroots initiative that was about public education. We were just educating the public generally as community educators, using the media to kind of amplify some of not only our voices, but the voices of the movement in different parts of the world. And that was key in trying to shift this um, focus on reparations just being synonymous with money or compensation. And so out of the UK experience in particular, more so than any other region, um, in the world, we have been championing reparations as repair. That is something uniquely that has come out of the UK experience and Pan-African organizing that was linked to um, initiatives on the continent. But then come 2007 and beyond, and I know you've spoken a lot about that, it's like, and then with the CARICOM um, initiative in 2013, it's like a lot of the public discourse went right back to base around compensation, just payment of compensation and making that synonymous with the whole struggle for reparations. So it's extremely problematic and we've not been able to as yet muster um, the resources to actually do the media work and the public educational work in a systematic and mass-based way. And that brings us to another issue. Um, which is about the NGOization sorry, of reparations activism. So what you have now are a lot of NGOs that are formed that are kind of very bureaucratic and quite disconnected from community campaigns and struggles and activist groups who have long been working on these issues. And with that, there is concern about where some of the funding is coming from that funds some of these networks, including Soros funding and, and other things like that. And we all know about who pays the piper pays the tune. So there's a, on the one hand, we, we struggle with the uh, financial resources, but on the other hand, uh, we're caught in this trap or this binary around where do resources actually come from to sustain the work that we do, which is transnational organizing. Even as UK-based activists, it's not a British or a black British movement. In Britain, it's never been that way. It's never been about reparations for black British people. It's always been about reparations for people of African heritage, whether they self-define as black British, Caribbean, dual heritage, African, whatever. The movement's always been like that. So these are the real challenges. We haven't quite yet figured out all of the answers. And it is also about trying to develop those resources amongst ourselves and build 
the community capacity and the organizational infrastructure to be able to support these initiatives and agendas strategically so that we can maintain custodianship of our movement so that reparations doesn't now become just having some more microfinancing and uh, startup businesses, which is what I hear some people talking about. Thank you. Uh, Nikki, 2001 was also the year of the Tubati law, yeah, mm -hmm. this law in France that declared the, the Atlantic slave trade in the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, Indian Ocean slave trade to be a crime against humanity. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, has there been a backtracking a bit since, and elaborate maybe a bit more on since well, so since, since the kind of celebration yeah. or yeah, uh, uh, the kind of Republican celebration mm. of having passed this. Well, to be honest, I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't that much of a... Uh, the number of uh, MPs who were actually in the Assemblée Nationale at the time that the law was passed was, was, was relatively um, small. And in all honesty, the media, talking about media blackout, like um, there wasn't a huge amount of media coverage of this issue either. Um, and it wasn't really until, it, you know, it always takes a controversy. So it wasn't until 2005 where you suddenly see kind of French historians mobilizing against what they categorized more generally as uh, the, in inverted commas, memory laws, including uh, the Loi Taubira, uh, the, the Taubira law recognizing slavery as a crime against humanity, saying that it was limiting the way that they wanted to perceive and write about history, that they shouldn't have limits and restraints placed on them. And this kind of, this was in the context of another law uh, on the 23rd of February that was proposed by a right-wing group uh, saying that uh, the education of um, al uh, education or pedagogy in schools should teach the positive aspects of Algerian colonization, extremely problematic. So it was in the context of all of this, and, and into that was thrown uh, the Taubira law as well. Um, and then the other times that it kind of emerges as a, as a media issue um, are around, uh, potentially around kind of the 10th of May and the presidential address and presidential tours. Um, and usually only then if something happens like Lacan uh, talks about reparations and, you know, Hollande makes uh, what was seen as a political gaffe by talking about his desire to repay the debt to Haiti, which of course wasn't what he meant at all, as he quickly uh, told us a few days later to uh, explain anything to do with um, people or activists who are talking about reparations and trying to sort of discuss what that means to them. Um, beyond... Well, you know, it's memory, and that's what we've done, and memory is reparations, and memory is moral reparations, therefore everything else is, what, immoral, um, is, is my question. But there has been some kind of, you know, major things that have happened in France. For example, the inauguration of Memorial Act, um, the... the uh, the word in French, the rehabilitation of, uh, no, that's not the word, the restoration of the museums, for example, so they now incorporate a much more uh, evident history of the involvement of those ports uh, in the transatlantic um, and transoceanic slave trades, uh, the, the opening of other memorial sites as well. So there has been, recognition has brought about a more visible uh, memorial presence within France, but has that actually had then positive effects in terms of the communities, well I think it gives us a, a site around which and a space in which to talk about these issues certainly. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots more I could go on, but yeah, and the fact that, you know, France has a, a national committee for remembering, although that's in a bit crisis at the moment, um, does perhaps keep this on the political agenda, but it depends who's in charge, and often they're towing the line, which is let's never, you know, muddy the waters between slavery, which was done with abolition, by the way, and colonialism, which came afterwards. Right. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to, to switch now to, uh, to the sessions of, uh, at the table, and then we'll come back with some, some questions that possibly at the end. But I think uh, worthwhile to, to consider a couple of questions or issues, and that is, in the first is reparations. What are reparations and what type of reparations are we talking about and for what? Uh, is there a site and space for discourse and for reparations uh, in the UK and beyond? And I think maybe also to, to consider to what extent uh, is there a movement into the mainstream of reparations. Mm. Off you go then. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, our obligations are then to join one of the tables oh, uh, okay. and to moderate a bit and then oh, we'll come okay. back and, and okay. see that. Yeah. All right, sure. We still haven't heard about it. So okay. I'm still waiting to oh, hear as soon okay. as I hear anything. I'm sure, like, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. When, are they, when are they supposed yeah. to be? Supposed to be well, um, yeah. I think they're supposed to let us know this month, so oh, I keep it anxiously checking my email. And so the history of the movement in Britain has always embraced a global conceptualization of reparations or reparatory justice. And that kind of comes out in the way that we organize, the way we advocate, um, what we say are the goals and, and, and how we go about working to achieve them as well. Oh, all right, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we talked initially a little bit about some of the, um, the strategies that have been taken up by various groups uh, within the French Republic to get reparations uh, either on the table or the legalistic routes that have been taken. So we briefly referred to that. And then we, we began talking about um, what Esther had been talking about, really, in terms of this idea of, of return, re uh, remat uh, re rematriation or repatriation. And just like different people's responses to that idea of the creation of, of some sort of you know, nation and, and how do people feel about that. Um, so we spent some time um, discussing that from kind of different, different perspectives. And yeah, that was it. And yeah, <laughs> it, was a, it was a good discussion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, time is moving on. And so we're going to quickly move into the next session. But I wanted to ask if you would join me in thanking our speakers for their contribution today. Okay, so um, for the last, it's not really a session, it's kind of a, just to give you some sort of light at the end of the tunnel, it is closing remarks, so that's, uh, that's how we're framing it. I'm going to uh, just introduce both of uh, the last speakers very, very briefly. Um, really, really pleased uh, that they were able to participate. So um, it's Angelina Osborne's going to be speaking first, and Angelina is an independent researcher. She's also a heritage consultant. Uh, she has a PhD in history from the Wilberforce Institute and her research focuses uh, on the pro-slavery West India Committee. Uh, prior to her doctoral studies, uh, she worked as a freelance historical researcher, writer and consultant. Um, and uh, I, I've, I've used her books before when I've been doing public history work, particularly in Hackney. She's written a great book uh, on Olada Equiano's daughter, Joanna Vassa. Uh, she's done... Uh, educational resources, workshops, uh, all kinds of different. So she basically embodies kind of the academic scholarship, but also the public history. So I'm really uh, excited to hear her final comments uh, on the day. And then she's joined by uh, Alan Rice, who's a professor in English and American studies at the University of Central Lancashire. Uh, Alan is also co-director of uh, the Institute for Black Atlantic Research, which he co-directs with Lubaina Himid, whose work we've heard about, uh, I think, pretty much continuously in pockets uh, throughout the day. So she's a, a, an artist, um, and she's also a professor at UCLan as well. 
Um, Alan's written extensively on different aspects of the memorialization uh, of the slave trade and slavery, linking uh, ideas of memory uh, and identity. Uh, and so I'm really, really pleased that they're both going to offer us uh, their, final, their final thoughts. I'll also to say that Alan's been involved in the recent, is it BBC Four? Four Radio Four. Yeah. Radio Four uh, programme looking at uh, black British history, which um, I'm very pleased to say my students have been listening to. So thank you. Um, I'll hand over to them. For day. It has been a long day and we've been asked to do a lot of thinking about um, uh, enslavement, its legacies, how it's taught, different aspects of, of the historical narrative. Um, I think it would have been very easy to have just devoted one day to each of these different um, aspects because they are so broad, they're so wide and so much could be discussed. Um, been asked today to, to consider all these a very interesting and exciting day. Um, I was uh, very much involved in uh, uh, 2007, what happened in 2007 around the bicentenary and different initiatives and, and activities around there. And I think I hoped, uh, many people probably hoped that at that point that would be that would be the sort of starting point for some real uh, genuine sort of deep discussions about um, slavery and its legacies. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. I think uh, after 2007, things just went very quiet. So it's very uh, gratifying and exciting that we are um, starting to have these discussions. Um, uh, I know they've been ongoing, um, but it's very exciting that we're having these, uh, these types of symposia again. Um, I suppose for me, in to, for today, uh, there's sort of, sort of general themes, I'm sure I've not covered all of them, but um, I think it's re remembering, um, forgetting, and reclamation are the things that particularly strike me, um, struck me in, uh, in this particular, today's, um, today's symposium, and um, I thought that, um, uh, I think uh, Catherine Hall said that uh, we're trying to bring uh, slavery home um, uh, in terms of talking about the project that she's been working on. Um, yes, of course, uh, these discussions have been going on for many, many years, um, um, So, uh, but the, the whole sort of legacies of British Slave Ownership Project has started to really, as she said, bring, it, bring, bring uh, things home things home so people can't really um, ignore or forget um, uh, that, that, that forget this this history um, I'm just just speaking just off off the top of my head I've made lots of notes um, uh, the, the the thing that, sort of, I suppose I should just go through, sort of, you know, so the other things that sort of struck me is the sort of the importance of exchanges, exchanges in the, the different, exchanges between communities, exchanges between uh, academia, um, exchanges between museums, we can't sort of um, deal and talk about these histories if there's sort of a, a, a sort of a proper kind of exchange and dialogue between all these different these different um, aspects. So I thought that was a really important thing that was uh, that came up um, when talking about this. There was so many different things. I mean, um, as I said, each one could have been dealt with independently in one day. Um, so, um, so just remembering, remembering, uh, putting um, memory of a, of the history of enslavement back on on the agenda, um, discussing uh, the importance of what the impact of of forgetting has done, because it makes, I guess, it makes uh, our our job much uh, very challenging, because we're trying to. Um, uh, Get people to um, remember something that they that hasn't really even really been discussed. As as be, has been mentioned, there's been a, a, a privileging of of the ending of enslavement, but not m much of privileging of what was actually being fought to 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 end. Um, so I guess I'm just speaking very very briefly. Is that it, this has been a very uh, exciting day? I think. Um, there's more, there's even more tomorrow, um, and that we need to really continue um, having these discussions, um, in di in, not just in these types of forums, but also amongst ourselves, um, and also we also have to consider also really those, those challenges um, uh, which, which we've discussed in terms of how we teach uh, this history and how we remember it. So 
um, I just think it's just really like to say that it's been a really, really interesting day, particularly the, the format of the day in terms of while we did the usual presentations and the questions, it was also really great that everybody was, then it, the, the discussion was passed back to the people at, the, at your table. So you were encouraged maybe to talk to people that you may not know uh, about these issues so you could get lots of wide range of different perspectives and thoughts. I know that in, on my table I had I listened to some great um, discussions about after each of the presentations that we had to um, converse and discuss and try to dissect what we've been uh, been presented with today. So that was a really great way of um, great way of, of, of um, being more interactive and involving uh, the audience um, partic as participants. So um, I'd like to hope that this is a, a format that can continue. Um, but in closing, I'd just like to say it's been a really, really um, interesting and exciting um, day. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Angelina. Um, I wanted to, to also to thank, thank the organisers for getting together such an interesting programme. And what I wanted to um, talk about, really, was the importance of working across chronologies and across geographies in this work we do. That is that, and in doing interdisciplinary work, and what, what um, the panels have shown is the fact that if someone, someone like uh, Ingrid Pollard or Evan Ifekoya, if they're here and talking about their artwork, they're inevitably talking about the history of black presence here in really interesting ways. And I wanted to sort of talk about um, the um, international geographies because the, one, of the, um, one of the things which we aren't able to do in such a short um, day is to take on other countries in Europe. And it was great to hear the French perspective. That was really good. But um, uh, I've spent a lot of time in Holland in the past um, 10, 15 years. I've gone back continually. And, and people there have, um, have made a guidebook um, to, to Amsterdam uh, about slave... Um, it's almost like a, um, it's a, it's a lovely thing. It's bilingual. It's in English and in Dutch. And you can pick it up and you can walk around, um, around um, Holland looking, sorry, around, around Amsterdam. And they're doing it in other towns now as well. And it will take you to slave sites. And I, I, I think that, that that's an incredible thing that's, that, that's happened there. And it's happened by lo through local activists. Um, and, and that they, they've got these things together. And the, the, that you can now do a slave site tour of Amsterdam, I think, is, is a wonderful thing. And you can self-direct or people are, are doing slave site tours. And, and I want to contrast that really with other countries like maybe Spain and Portugal, where there's less um, uh, engagement with the history of slavery. So this is something where we, we really need to kind of try and work on a pan-European level to try and try and actually get things moving elsewhere. And I've been trying to do that through the EU. We might not be able to do it for much longer. But anyway, so um, in this idea of walking, though, what I wanted to talk about was um, uh, a couple of things. The first thing was um, uh, Ingrid in the first... Um, Ingrid Pollard in the first uh, session had talked about Sambo's Grave, which is in my hometown in Lancaster. And I've been doing walking tours there, to there and round there for the past 15 years as a means of getting people to think about the history of transatlantic slavery. And as um, Ingrid would tell us, it's an amazing site. It's probably a unique site um, of a slave grave um, in, in, in the world in that it's... Uh, it's been continuously um, visited since um, um, 1796, and it's a 1736 site. And, it's, and we know a lot about what happened there. So um, this particular tour was a, a tour with 50 people from all, probably 25 different countries. And I took them there, but I also took them to the Grand Theatre in Lancaster, where Ira Aldridge did one of his first... Um, performances and what what I was trying to do here was just to kind of say look look some people you know some some people came here as slaves but some people came here as free men and did incredible things Ira Aldridge uh, uh, one of the the earliest men uh, the earliest black man to play a fellow on a British stage the earliest black man we know about I'll say that um, and and then I wanted to talk about another walk and um, this walk was a walk which happened in Scotland in uh, 2007. 
where 300 people walked from the port side uh, in Musselburgh to uh, Inveresk Lodge Gardens. Uh, uh, and this really relates to, um, uh, uh, to um, Lisa and Bright Ideas in that um, uh, they went to Inveresk Lodge Gardens because uh, it was the plantation home of James Wedderburn. Uh, now, the name Wedderburn might, might um, start your head going uh, in that the, he was the father of Robert Wedderburn. Now, Robert Wedderburn had turned up at that house, Inveress Lodge Gardens, this beautiful house, um, in 1785. Um, he's a free black man. He was penniless. The reason he turned up in that house, at that house, was to lobby his own father, the white plantation owner, to give him some money for his family, uh, and 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 to do more than that, to claim himself as the heir. And he was sent away with a crooked sixpence and a half pint of beer. And this march of 300 people um, to um, Inveress Lodge Gardens was an attempt to put Robert Wedderburn back into the history of Scotland. Now, um, you might think that uh, this march, which was sponsored by the Scottish churches, would mean that now when you go into Inveress Lodge Gardens, there'd be a plaque about Robert Wedderburn. There is nothing at all about Robert Wedderburn in Velasco Lodge Gardens eight years later in 2015, 2016. So what we um, need to do is we need to have a guerrilla campaign, a campaign of guerrilla memorialization. And um, every time me and my friends go to that house, we write in the, um, in the, uh, in the, um, in the visitor book why are you ignoring the life of Robert Wedderburn uh, uh, in order to aggrandise a slave owner, James Wedderburn? And I suppose that's what I'd like to say, that this conference has brought together activism and academicism, and I think we should do that and bring it together in our daily lives wherever we go. Thank you. session but this is just a reminder that we also have a program for this evening uh, there's some wine and some snacks outside and some water you might feel you need something more substantial than snacks but please do help yourselves uh, to them first uh, tonight's program is going to be looking at something that we haven't looked at much today which is um, you know, the issue of poetry creative writing um, and the ways in which that informs um, our memory uh, and our representation of um, slavery and uh, other, other issues uh, along the way. So I just want to thank you all for your participation so far today. Thank you so much, because I know it's been a long day and there's been a lot of talking. Um, and um, I, hope, I hope to see you this evening and also tomorrow as well. So the Yes, that's a Yeah, exactly. That's a <laughs> Remember your stuff. <laughs> Is that yours too? <laughs> <clears throat> I think I will um I have to go I have to pick up my son and pick All up. Alright, okay. <laughs> I could see, are you coming back this evening or not? I can't, I've got to go back to London because I've right. got for my son today. Oh gosh, well, best of luck with that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> nice to have your kids still at home, one both left in September. Oh, did they? No, he's seven, he's Gone still got university, a few... Which is nice for them and nice for me in lots of ways, but yeah. just that kind of loss thing, you know. Yeah, oh, I've got a few more years Yeah, so go. good, good. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> 12 years. Yeah, uh, good, good. Oh, well, I've always told you he's going to be a forever. So. Yeah, okay, great. Well, nice to see you. I'll catch nice you, but you too. maybe again to another okay, event. Thank Cheers. Bye bye. Bye
la la la.